58 and it's two minutes after, so I'd like to get us started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, it's a pleasure to have everyone here. If I could please ask um, everyone on the panelist side to mute uh, so that we reduce ambient noise, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our first um, annual and what I hope will become really an annual tradition, um, the Autosomal Dominant Tubular Interstitial Kidney Disease International Summit. It is a great pleasure to have everyone um, here today. And um, really just the, 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 the goal of all of this, um, you know, Tony Blyer and I have been sort of co-organizers of this and, and are so uh, delighted to, to welcome everyone today. Um, it's really about community building. Um, it's, uh, you know, rare kidney diseases that we're dealing with um, here. And um, if there's anything that we have learned from um, making progress in the rare disease space, it's that community really matters. And that means a community of colleagues and collaborators, of course, um, but also a community together with patients um, and their families. And uh, I think this is the purpose of this meeting to really bring us all together to discuss uh, both uh, scientific matters, uh, matters of uh, clinical importance, and then um, everything that matters to our patients as well and answer um, any questions over this next um, two days. Um, our community spans the globe. Um, it is remarkable what can be achieved with modern technology, but um, we wanted to do this in person. And of course, coronavirus uh, took us virtual. But in some ways, maybe this facilitates uh, participation from uh, everywhere. And so indeed, it's uh, been really a pleasure to see that we have uh, panelists, speakers, and participants from all over the world, including um, you know, Europe, the United States, Australia. Um, and that's why we are choosing this time in order to accommodate as many um, time zones as possible around the world. And so it's just really been uh, terrific to see this uh, in terms of our community building efforts. Um, what is very important for rare diseases, uh, together with community building, is actually advocacy. Um, and uh, for that, um, I'd like to thank and uh, recognize uh, the Rare Kidney Z Disease Foundation, represented here by uh, Drew Ludlow, who is um, really responsible for organizing this and hosting this event um, on this uh, uh, Zoom program. Um, and so I'm very grateful uh, to Drew um, and also um, to Rich, Richard Nelson. Um, both of them are um, co-chairing the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation and they've been really tremendous in terms of um, advocacy and community building which are really important uh, for these diseases. Um, you will get to hear more um, from them um, and about them and their families um, tomorrow and I think it's going to be uh, really uh, terrific to have uh, the voices of patients come through um, at different stages um, of this meeting. Even when we're talking shop, if you will, you know, we're talking science, um, we welcome patients witnessing our conversations and, you know, trying to understand, you know, what we're talking about and then us uh, tomorrow taking the opportunity to answer any questions that have arisen uh, through our scientific and uh, medical deliberations uh, later today. I want to, of course, uh, thank also our speakers and our panelists who have uh, made it here today from literally everywhere and it will be just wonderful to hear from everyone's perspective. Um, I did want to recognize Catherine Blakesley and uh, Kendra Kidd, who have been instrumental in pulling all of this together. You have received emails from uh, both of them, and they really are behind the scenes uh, pulling all of this together and taking care of every aspect um, of what it took to organize this. And of course, finally, um, and uh, most of all, I want to recognize Tony Blyer, my partner in crime in all things uh, related to ADTKD. Uh, we have been collaborators for a long time and he's been a tremendous partner. He's hosting the day tomorrow. So we're sort of alternating and, and tag teaming this, but we've really, it's been a tremendous um, uh, collaboration and uh, one that I hope will continue. Um, but importantly, the two of us want to collaborate with all of you and in many ways we have already. Um, and I think that's, that's the point of, of the meeting today. So I just wanted to briefly go through the agenda to orient us as to what we're doing today. And then without further ado, um, uh, introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, we're starting today with um, our keynote address uh, from Martin Pilhofer. We're very lucky to have him from the Etta Hein Zurich. Uh, and he's going to speak to us, uh, as you will see in a moment, about um, your modulin structure function studies. 
Um, and then we're going to dive into ADTKD and really try to understand uh, how much scientific progress has been made uh, thus far. We are going to hear from Eric Ollinger about uh, UMOD uh, mutations. We're going to hear from Valeria Padovano um, from the Broad about Mach 1. We're going to hear from uh, Martina Zivna um, about REN mutations. Uh, Peter Harris will take us through um, what we currently know about um, DNA JB11. Um, and we're very lucky also to have Marie Hogan, um, who will uh, uh, speak about her truly pioneering work in biomarkers. Um, I think to some extent focused on PKD, but potentially beyond um, in terms of kidney disease. It's such an important uh, matter. Uh, we are, of course, scheduled to take breaks so that we can all take bio breaks as well as a stretching break. It's hard to be on the computer the whole time. Um, but um, we will uh, then have a panel discussion um, today which I'm really looking forward to. It will be uh, moderated by Tony. And we really want to hear from colleagues all around the world um, who can um, give us updates on what they see on the ground with their patients, um, you know, what questions they're getting, what's the status of the patient populations um, in their countries, and what they see as the need as we try to build this community, um, the need um, uh, for their patients uh, in, in uh, each of their, um, the countries they represent. Um, and then we will close the day with um, another uh, wonderful keynote address uh, by my friend and colleague Ben Deverman, uh, who is uh, truly one of the world's AV uh, gene therapy experts. Um, and um, so we, we will hear from his pioneering work um, in this space, which of course is uh, um, extremely uh, relevant to the uh, rare disease space and, and curing rare uh, diseases. Uh, tomorrow's day is devoted to more um, clinical matters uh, and also patient, the patient voice. Um, so uh, Tony will be uh, hosting the day tomorrow and um, we will have, um, we will hear from um, an MKD family, uh, specifically Richard and Drew. Um, and uh, then we will have a talk from Tony about uh, the natural history study on ADTKD, which he has been uh, spearheading with many of you. This is critically important if we're gonna make it to the clinic we need to have the appropriate um, natural history data uh, to support our package to the FDA. So this is really an important um, aspect of the work that we will do together uh, as we move toward clinical trials. Um, and then uh, finally, we are gonna have an Ask Me Anything panel uh, for our uh, patients and families to really um, digest the information that they heard over the last two days and ask us any questions that come to mind and we will do our best to explain and, um, and convey uh, where we are in this process um, uh, importantly then, um, uh, Kendra Kidd will take us through REDCap, which is uh, the system that we hope to use um, in order to organize our patients all around the world and, and keep uh, the data safe, um, as well as uh, aggregated in a way that we can all utilize, uh, again, with an eye to clinical trials. And after a break, we will uh, have a closing discussion where I was just really hoping for a um, kind of a um, discussion amongst uh, all of us um, about where we go from here, participation from both panelists, uh, patients, families, scientists, physicians, um, just about how we build this community further and what we would like to see for perhaps next year's event. Um, I did want to mention that uh, there is a, um, a Q&A uh, function um, that allows anyone to ask a question um, and we will try to moderate this and get to as many questions as possible as time allows. And certainly during the times when we have scheduled time for discussion, we can you know, go back and review some of the questions um, and anyone can uh, put a question in the Q&A. So I encourage anyone who has a question to, to participate, uh, maybe holding questions from patients and families for tomorrow and hoping to focus a little bit more on scientific matters today, but really anything goes, uh, it's part of our community uh, building efforts. So, uh, without uh, further ado, um, I wanted to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Professor Martin Pilhofer, uh, comes to us from the um, ETH in Zurich, uh, where he's, he's an associate professor in the Department of Biology at the Institute for Molecular Biology and Biophysics. Um, uh, professor Pilhofer uh, hails initially from Germany, from Bavaria, as I understand, um, and um, did his training initially in, uh, at the Technical University in Munich, uh, and then came to the United States, actually, where he uh, did his postdoc with uh, Grant Jensen, a very famous lab at Caltech, um, and then went back to uh, Zurich at the Etihad to start his laboratory and has made 
uh, very significant contributions um, in uh, the areas that you will be hearing about today, uh, specifically bacterial cell-cell interactions and um, cryo um, uh, and, and the way that you can use this to uh, identify uh, structure function relationships for macromolecular machines. Um, he's the recipient of many awards, um, including importantly, a 2018 um, Embo Young Investigator Award, which is a very coveted award and uh, really speaks to the uh, enormous uh, both contributions thus far and potential of his research for the future. Um, and so uh, without further ado, uh, Martin, we welcome you and look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Anna. Can you uh, hear me well? Is that right? Okay. Very well. So, um, I will switch uh, now to share my screen. Excellent. Let's see. Okay. Is that does that work? Yeah. Okay. So thanks a lot, uh, Anna. It's uh, it's really a pleasure, um, um, and I would like to say thank you for the for the invitation. Um, it is obviously. Uh, extremely exciting and, and very interesting uh, to, to, to join this, uh, this symposium because it's um, a community to which uh, previously I did not have um, much contact to. And uh, so therefore I also <clears throat> tried to tailor the talk somewhat um, to also explain some of the methods that we are using in order to, to uh, study macromolecular uh, complexes um, such as Euromodulin. Um, uh, since this might be might be interesting for you in, in, in more general terms and I don't think I have to, to introduce um, Euromodulin in, in too much detail since you're probably all um, much more familiar uh, uh, with it than, than, than I am. So um, just as a, as a brief um, overview what we do in my lab, in my lab we are mainly interested in um, interactions of bacteria with other cells and, and those can be either interactions between bacteria and other bacteria or bacteria and, and eukaryotes and in most of these cases these interactions are somehow mediated by some effector proteins and so um, really the focus of my lab is to, to try to understand um, the macromolecular complexes that um, um, translocate these, these effector proteins. That's obviously a little um, off the focus from what I will tell you today. Um, and, and, and so um, um, the, the second part my, my lab is, is focusing on um, are also some, some methods, some imaging methods that we use in order to study biological systems. And uh, here, uh, just very briefly, um, one reason why uh, that prevented us from, from understanding macromolecular machines in the past was that um, the fields of structural biology and cell biology, they operated on really different scales of resolution. So cell biology did a lot of light microscopy. You can get an idea about structures um, on, on the order of, of, of uh, multi-microns, um, whereas the classical structural biology techniques, they resolve structures to atomic resolution where you can build atomic models. And the problem is that there was always this gap of resolution that prevented really from integrating data from one field and the other field. And um, therefore my, my lab um, um, employs a technique which is called cryoelectron tomography. Um, and as you will see later throughout the talk, um, we have employed in a way that we integrated with data from different fields of research in order to bridge this gap um, of structural biology with uh, cell biology to get a more comprehensive understanding of, um, of biological systems. Now, um, <clears throat> the study um, um, Anna asked me to, to talk about today is, um, is on uh, a recent publication um, that was really an interdisciplinary effort from, and, and a collaboration from uh, a number of different groups with different expertise. And the focus of um, that study was the, the human protein Euromodulin that you probably know much, much better than I do. Just as a, as a brief introduction, um, Euromodulin is, is um, exclusively produced by, uh, by uh, TAL cells. Um, it uh, can be a biomarker for, for renal functions, but I'm sure we will hear more in, in Eric's talk later, later on. Um, it is also the most abundant protein in human urine. So, um, um, human uh, produces on the order of 50 milligrams per 24 hours of, of this protein. Um, and in fact, when we studied the protein, we actually um, uh, purified it from human urine directly. Um, 
So um, it's, it's an 80 kilo Dalton protein, but a lot of its molecular weight actually comes not from the protein itself, but rather um, from the fact that it is also highly glycosylated. So it's, it's decorated with different sugars all along um, its, its sequence. And it is then um, expressed as a, as a, a GPI anchored protein um, that is then cleaved um, uh, by, a, by a protease called hepsin and released um, as uh, polymeric uh, filamentous structures into the, into the urine. So your modulin can have different functions, um, which are understood to, to, to very different degrees of, of, of detail. So on, on, this is a review from, from Olivier de Buist, who was a collaborator on this, on this project um, at the University of Zurich. Um, and um, so your modulin is uh, known to uh, protect against kidney stone formation. It's involved in um, innate immunity. Um, it also may have a role in, in blood pressure control and, and urinary concentration. Um, and uh, an aspect that we studied <clears throat> or that we focused on was um, that it is also known to protect against urinary tract infections. Um, furthermore, as you all know, um, uromodulin uh, can also lead to common or rare uh, kidney diseases. And um, I just would like to um, suggest to you this very nice, <clears throat> uh, concise overview that, that um, um, Eric published um, very recently. Um, that is a nice uh, uh, summary of, um, of, of the functions um, uh, and also uh, diseases that um, Euromodulin is, is involved in. <clears throat> so we were interested in the fact that um, there are studies from mice, but also from, from human that indicate that the presence of higher levels of Euromodulin lead to the fact that these individuals um, have a lower propensity um, having um, urinary tract infections. And so the basis of this <clears throat> was thought to um, be related to the way that um, urinary uh, uh, uropathogens uh, like this um, uh, uropathogenic E. coli cell here um, adheres to the epithelial cells in the urinary tract. And so this is an electron microscopy image of an E. coli cell. It has these uh, pili uh, structures on, on its surface. And on the tip of these pili, um, there is a protein called FIMH, which will be a key player in this study. And that FIMH protein can um, 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 uh, bind um, to um, um, uroplacin 1A um, receptors on the, on the epithelial cell cells, um, which, which are uh, uh, glycosylated um, by, by high mannose um, um, uh, glycosylation sites. And um, the idea here is, is that um, the way that uromodulin protects from urinary tract infections is that uromodulin itself is highly glycosylated and can compete um, for these binding sites and basically prevents the bacteria from adhering to the epithelial cells. So that, that was the idea which prevents them, uh, which um, allows then uh, the, the removal of the bacterial cells by, by micturition. Uh, there were a number of studies um, on the structure of uromodulin in the past. Um, one of them, a uh, key uh, study was, was uh, published um, by Bokov et al. in 2016, uh, which showed that Euromodulin um, really forms these long, flexible, um, roughly two micrometer long filaments, um, which have this uh, zigzag pattern that you can see here in these negative stain EM images. And at the same time, this study also solved a crystal structure of um, some of the domains of Euromodulin. So it included this um, um, uh, zona pellucida module and uh, the N terminal part and the C terminal part. And, um, and then this uh, EGF4 uh, domain, and this whole construct was then fused to a maltose binding protein. So th there was a high resolution structure of this polymerization module. And the idea was that this is uh, the module that, module that allows the protein to form polymers. Um, however, it was a rather artificial construct um, at the time in order to get it to crystallize and solve it by, um, by X-ray crystallography. And so when we started to work on this, on this protein, um, the study was really initiated by Olivier de Voist and uh, also um, Rudi Glockshuber, who is a, another professor in the Institute, 
um, at which I'm, I'm working at. And um, we kind of defined the questions that we wanted to answer. So on one hand, we wanted to re-establish a comprehensive glycosylation pattern. We wanted to understand the architecture of the euromodulin polymers. And we wanted to know um, how then FIMH, which is at this tip protein of the pili, can bind, um, can bind to, to, to euromodulin. Um, and then uh, finally, we were interested in, um, on, a, on a larger scale, how does um, euromodulin then allow or, or interact with, with entire whole bacterial cells? So our study was really um, on very different scales of resolution. <clears throat> and so this started out by um, Rudi Glockshuber's uh, lab and especially Max Sauer um, developing a protocol to purify euromodulin from urine from PhD students and postdocs. Um, and they had to overcome some obstacles because there was some protease activity that had to be inhibited. And so um, for the first time, they really established a, a very a protocol that allows the production of very stable euromodulin protein that can be stored over long periods of time um, in the lab. Um, furthermore, then um, Marcus Abbey, who is uh, in the uh, Institute of Microbiology, they then focused on um, mass spectrometry analysis of uh, euromodulin protein in order to determine um, the glycosylation pattern. And the first observation that they made was that um, the, the mass profile of euromodulin uh, does not really change much if you do have different, um, if you have female versus male donors and you also uh, don't see any, any uh, large differences um, um, uh, between individuals um, who are high uh, producers of, of euromodulin versus, versus low producers of, of, uh, of uh, euromodulin. And so this, this mass distribution was, was always uh, pretty, pretty similar, stemming from the fact that there's always a heterogeneity in the glycosylation of the protein. Um, furthermore, then they, they really looked into detail which kinds of types of glycosylations can you find on the protein, there were a number of glycosylation sites that had been identified previously. Uh, however, this is really now a comprehensive list taking this um, um, in, into, into much detail. And I guess that the most important, um, the most important observation here was that um, you have two sites, um, uh, this site um, um, here uh, in this DHC domain and a site in the um, ZP domain um, which are high monose sites. And the reason why this is important is um, because <clears throat> um, FIMH um, is known uh, to bind high monose glycosylation sites on the epithelial cells. And so um, there was a, a good chance that these, uh, one of these two sites could actually be the binding sites for FIMH to the euromodulin uh, protein. The next step that we took was we wanted to establish the, the structure of these euromodulin filaments. And so um, not all of you might know the concept of cryoelectron microscopy. And uh, I'll just very briefly introduce the, the concept here. So you all know about conventional electron microscopy, I'm sure. And so the problem with this conventional approach is that there has to be always dehydration, chemical fixation, staining. So it's a very harsh sample preparation procedure. And if you compare this to these uh, grapes here, then um, the cells or the structures that we look at in the electron microscope by conventional EM, they might be, might be rather uh, similar to these raisins. And so it's not really a technique that allows you to um, uh, to image uh, molecules or cells in a, in a neonative state. And so in electron microscopy or in cryo-electron microscopy, um, a technique that we, that we applied, um, we uh, pick up an EM grip with a, with a forceps. Um, then we lift up this grid into a humidified chamber. We add our sample, which can be either a cell or a protein. Um, and we then um, blot away excess liquid with a filter paper. And then we plunge this grid into liquid ethane propane. And that cryogen freezes the water so fast that it doesn't have time to form ice crystals. And so basically you have your cell or your protein embedded in a thin layer of ice, but it's an ice that is uh, called in, in a vitreous state. That means that it's an amorphous ice that does not have ice crystals. And so it's a glass-like ice that afterwards you can image, um, um, that afterwards you can image in one of these um, uh, fancy cryo-electron microscopes 
Um, and then there are basically two different modalities of cryo EM um, that you can apply in order to establish um, a three dimensional structure. So, on one hand, you have a technique called single particle cryo EM. Um, the Nobel Prize in uh, Chemistry was given to that technique in 2017. Um, and that is a technique that allows you to um, solve structures of purified com macromolecular complexes, uh, proteins, um, at a very high resolution. However, you need to have a very homogeneous um, and rigid um, uh, protein usually in order to do that. Now, the technique that we employ in my lab is cryoelectron tomography mainly because it allows us to also look at very heterogeneous and flexible structures and even whole cells. And so the, the way that we do this is basically we stick the grid into the microscope and we then uh, tilt the sample in the microscope and take images from different angles. Um, this is an example from one of our uh, other biological interests that we have. Um, we then can reconstruct this tilt series into a three-dimensional image. This is what we, what we call the tomogram that you see here. And then this tomogram can be uh, basically analyzed and in three dimensions, you can make a model of it and you can even improve the resolution of such a model by then averaging many of these uh, repeating subunits so that you get uh, basically um, a more detailed view of your biological complex. And we basically applied this technique of cryoelectron tomography and subtomogram averaging to euromodulin filaments that were purified um, from urine. This is a, a, an image, this is a, a, like a, a thin slice through a three-dimensional image of euromodulin filaments. You can see that um, they are rather flexible, they are bending at different degrees, and there were two major views, so this zigzag view, and then 90 degree um, uh, turned, um, we had this fishbone-like structure. And if we then extract many, many of these um, euromodulin um, uh, uh, subunits and we align them together in the computer and average them, then we get a much more detailed um, uh, structure and, and, and view of the molecule. And when we do that, um, I can show you um, how this looks like. So these are, again, the filaments that were purified um, from urine. And then once we average thousands <clears throat> of these um, segments of these filaments, then we were able to determine that structure of euromodulin. And so what we saw was that there is a, um, basically this, this, um, uh, this uh, zigzag, um, this is a zigzag structure here. Um, and we have these arm-like structures protruding off euromodulin um, that give it this um, um, fishbone-like appearance. Now, um, in order to understand which domains of the euromodulin protein form these different um, uh, structural modules, um, we took advantage of a fact that it was known that elastase can cleave euromodulin at a very specific um, site. And so once we cleave the protein with elastase and image it again, what we see is basically then um, the structure that consists of this green part here. And that is shown here, which is basically only the backbone. So based on that experiment, we then knew that the backbone really is formed by this EGF4 domain, the zona pellucida domains, which were also speculated by before by others um, being really responsible for the polymerization of the, of the filament. The arms, on the other hand, that you can see here, those are formed by this DHC domain, as well as these EGF4, uh, EGF1 to 3 domains. Um, and so looking at this now, we realize that there's one um, high site where FIMH could bind on the arm, and there's one high site on the core of the filament. And so we wanted to further investigate then how FIMH can bind and where it would bind on this uh, euromodulin structure. And so the way that we, um, <clears throat> this is just one slide showing that where we, where we used the existing crystal structure, high resolution structure of ZPZ and ZPN and EGF4. Uh, and we basically, based on our subtomogram averages, we then docked these structures into this backbone model. And we came up then with a, um, with a model of how um, um, uh, euromodulin can 
um, can polymerize and that EGF4 uh, would be basically um, at the base um, of where the arm um, extends. <clears throat> but in order to understand then how FIMH, which is this tip protein from the pili, binds to uromodulin, um, Rudy Glockshuber's lab, they uh, conducted a number of biophysical essays and experiments, um, which I won't go into detail, but the result of that was that they um, uh, investigated that on average, two molecules um, of FIMH bind to one, um, bind to one molecule um, of uh, uromodulin. And so we then also um, tested this by uh, imaging a sample in which we incubated uromodulin filaments with FIMH protein. And what we saw were these extra densities here on the arms of the uromodulin. And one of these extra densities could, uh, um, could accommodate roughly two molecules of FIMH. So um, the backbone itself did not show um, any extra density. So we don't think that the high monocyte at the backbone is accessible for binding FIMH, but rather that two molecules of FIMH bind to the high monocyte that sits on the arm um, of the, of the uromodulin. <clears throat> Now, the next uh, question we wanted to answer was, so how does this look like if then a pileated cell, a pileated E. coli cell, for example, um, is incubated with uromodulin? And so we basically did that. Um, again, we plunge froze the sample um, with a bacteria and the protein, and we collected cryotomograms. And what you see is here um, the tip of a cell. You can also see these, these black structures which are protruding from the cell, which are the, the, the pili. And then there are lots of uromodulin um, filaments that are really um, assembling around and associating um, with the, the bacteria. And so interestingly, this behavior of uromodulin filaments binding to the, to the pili here of E. coli um, um, is, is really uh, basically dependent on, on uromodulin um, um, and pili. So we, if we image, for example, a non-piliated um, E. coli cell, we would not find this constant um, association of uromodulin filament with a bacteria. So this is uh, dependent on having pili, um, and it is also dependent on having um, um, the, the arm module of uromodulin, because if we do the same experiment, with the elastase digested version where we don't have the arms, um, the filaments do not associate with the, with the cells. Um, a really unexpected and, and uh, very surprising observation that um, we made was um, when we then also on a larger scale imaged the bacteria that were incubated with uromodulin filaments by light microscopy. Um, and so this uh, work was then done by, again, by a student in Rudy Glockshuber's lab, Chess uh, Stanisic. And uh, she observed very frequently that, um, in fact, when she looks at co-incubations of uromodulin with a bacteria, that the um, bacteria, they, they seem to aggregate in these samples. And again, this aggregation was dependent on having pileated cells, and it did not happen um, when we used um, uh, elastase-treated uromodulin. Um, furthermore, she could also show that if she incubated bacteria with uromodulin in the presence of mannose, then again, she cannot see such an aggregation um, um, of, these, uh, of these bacteria. So that was a, there was a new observation that was not known before that uromodulin apparently, at least in vitro, um, as we show here, can aggregate bacteria. And the idea is that maybe then this aggregation allows um, easy, easy, uh, more easy uh, clearance of the bacteria from the urinary tract um, if they are aggregated uh, together. Um, we wanted to investigate this further, whether this is really um, mediated by uromodulin. And so what we did was um, we uh, um, stained the uromodulin fluorescently as well as the bacteria. And we saw very frequently that in these clusters, really uromodulin and E. coli cells co-localize. And so um, again, we wanted to image such an aggregate by cryolecton tomography. However, there's a, there's a huge 
um, limitation to the technique in a way that we need to have a very thin sample in order to um, image it by cryo-electron tomography. And so fortunately there is a, um, a sample thinning technique um, that has been um, uh, developed uh, throughout the last maybe five years. It's an extremely exciting technique because it allows us now also to look at eukaryotic cells um, and larger um, cell aggregates. And so this technique basically uses a focused ion beam to cut away the top and the, and the bottom of a sample and produce very thin lamella for cryotomography imaging. So this is called cryo-focused ion beam milling. And we used this, um, this workflow that we developed in my lab to basically plunge freeze these aggregates. We uh, did cryo-focused ion beam milling in a scanning electron microscope. And then we do the imaging as I showed you before. This is an example of where we do this um, on uh, cyanobacterial cells for different projects. So here you can see how we, we mill away um, the material in these red boxes and we produce this very thin lamella that can be then afterwards imaged. And this is the example from Euromodulin where we basically have these, um, these aggregates here of cells that were aggregated by Euromodulin and then we milled this thin lamella into the, into the sample um, and then these uh, thin lamella can be imaged by tomography. And again, what we can see is that if we have a bacterial cell, they're completely embedded almost, um, um, they're completely embedded in a, in a very dense meshwork of Euromodulin uh, uh, filaments. Um, so that, that was, that was the, the, the observation here. And um, <clears throat> now the, the big question of, of course for us then was um, this aggregation um, that I showed before. So this, this phenomenon that, that nobody had reported really before. Um, our question was then, so is this something that we somehow artificially produce in the lab or is this something that we really can also observe um, in patient samples? And so um, we started to talk to somebody at the Kinderspital in Zürich to uh, Johannes Turück, and we asked him whether he could provide us with uh, samples from uh, patients, basically with urine from patients with urinary, urinary tract infections. And we asked him um, for our technique to image it um, so that it was not treated in any way with any chemicals or, or, or drugs uh, before we actually um, um, got the sample for, for plunge freezing. So um, we tried to, to pick up the sample as quickly as possible um, once these patients were in the hospital. And we plunge froze um, these and, and imaged them again by cryo tomography, but also by light microscopy. And what we found was um, in this case, for example, so this is a urinary tract infection uh, uh, patient with an E. coli infection. And what we saw is, for example, in, in many cases, again, uh, okay, this doesn't work. Let me try again. So here you can see again, uh, panning up and down through the tomogram, there's a bacterial cell up here um, it has also very long pili. You can follow this pillus all the way down here. And then down here, it attaches um, to a euromodulin uh, filament um, down here um, that you might be able to see. And, and so, um, so this was this example here where you really have the, the pillus attaching to the euromodulin filament. There's another example here. Um, so, in many cases where we imaged, uh, where we took different images, either light microscopy images or crowd tomography images of um, this um, uh, urine that was not treated in any way, basically, we didn't even concentrate it, we just plunge froze the urine, basically. Um, we could see that almost always there was an association of euromodulin with pili and the bacteria. And by light microscopy, very often we could also see that in fact those cells were aggregated together, which was something that, that uh, at least to my knowledge, had not been um, reported before. <clears throat> Um, interestingly, of course, um, once the sample was taken from the patient, we didn't right away know which kind of bacterial infection we were looking at. And so, um, uh, uh, therefore, it happened that when we looked at urine samples from different patients, afterwards we found out uh, through the hospital diagnostics 
which kind of um, bacterium um, uh, caused the infection. And so here in this case, I'm showing um, the case of uh, um, Klebsiella. So Klebsiella um, uh, also showed this aggregation and it also showed the association um, of the filaments um, with, a, with a bacteria. And in addition to that, um, we also uh, found, for example, the, the, the same behavior um, in uh, Streptococcus mitis. And, and so this is, this is um, interesting. Um, I'll come back to this in, in one second. Um, just before, I would like to show our general model. So um, as, a, as a summary of, of what I've shown today for uropathogenic E. coli cells that have these type 1 pili. So usually, um, as I said, these, these E. coli cells use the pili to attach to the urinary tract epithelium um, so that they can also um, then cause infection. Um, the human body produces these highly glycosylated uromodulin filaments. Um, those filaments have high monocytes on the arm of the filament, and these high monocytes compete with the glycosylated receptors on the epithelial cells. They bind to the pili, and they lead not only to the shielding of the binding sites of the pili, so that they cannot bind to the epithelial cells, but as we showed, this also leads to the aggregation of the bacteria. And we think that this aggregation also makes it then easier to remove the bacteria by, um, by micturition. And one interesting aspect is that, um, as you saw at the beginning of my talk, the glycosylation pattern of uromodulin is really very complex. And there's many other uh, glycosylation sites that are presented on these arms. And so, um, Interestingly, when we now use, again, a different real uropathogenic uh, strain, E. coli CFT073, it has three different types of pili. And this is very usual that, that uh, um, uropathogens can switch um, their, their pili and adhesins. And so this uh, strain has three different types of pili, which are known to bind three different types of glycosylation. So sialic acid, gal galactose, and mannose. And so when we do again this experiment where we show by light microscopy this aggregation behavior that is uromodulin mediated, then we see that in this strain, if we add mannose, we cannot or only a little bit um, um, decrease this aggregation uh, phenomenon. Um, but if we add all three uh, sugars to that incubation, then we can very efficiently um, avoid the aggregation um, of the bacteria. And so that tells us that probably uromodulin um, uh, presents um, this diversity of glycosylation sites on the protein. Um, and it is likely that um, not only the high monocyte binds to type 1 pili, but that other glycosylation sites might bind to other types of pili of other uropathogens. So it's likely um, a more general mechanism rather than just being relevant um, for type 1 pili. Okay, so um, yeah, as I said, so this, this um, uh, study was, was recently published um, by, by a really nice col collaboration of, of uh, um, uh, Olivier de Vuys at, at the University of Zürich, Ludwig Loxhuber, um, who did the biophysical studies here um, in, in the Institute. Um, there was Markus Ebi, who did the, the glycosylation analysis, um, 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 Sebastian Trück, who, who, did, um, who provided us with, with the samples. Um, from, from patients. Um, and uh, this, this schematic is, is just taken from this little uh, primer about our paper um, that was also published um, at, the, at the same time. So um, with this, um, I, I would like to just acknowledge uh, the people who were uh, involved in this. I, I just named most of them. So in my lab, um, the main person was involved uh, was, was um, uh, Gregor Weiss, but then there were other, um, uh, actually th uh, other two PhD students who really were the, the, the heads and the pioneers of this, this project and, and uh, pushed, um, pushed this forward. Um, in the initial stages also, um, Eric was, was involved in the project um, with, with Olivier de Bois. And um, I don't know how much time I have uh, left. Um, is, is there? We're good, yeah. Okay, because I, I, I just wanted to mention that maybe for, for your community, what could be also interesting is, um, if you give me three more minutes, I, I, yes. would, show, I would show maybe um, just three more slides um, that um, the lab of uh, Rudi Glockshuber um, then used um, 
in addition to cryo-electron tomography that we used, we, we were able to resolve the structure to maybe 1.5 nanometers of resolution. But what Rudy Glockshuber did was, um, even though those filaments are so flexible, they tried to solve basically the structure by single particle cryo-EM and really resolve a high resolution structure. And in fact, they were um, successful in that. And so um, even more recently, just I think uh, this month or last month, this came out in eLife, this paper, uh, where really Rudy Glockshuber was the, the, the driving force and, and his student, um, where basically they used this other modality of cryo-EM um, in order to really reconstruct an atomic model of the backbone of the uromodulin protein. Um, and the interesting observation there was that um, it has a very interesting filament architecture because as you can see here, um, the, 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 the ZPZ, uh, C and ZPN domain of one, uh, um, of one uh, subunit basically, they are not polymerizing with each other or they are not sitting next to each other, but rather they are sitting far apart and they are um, connected by this very long linker. And, and so basically <clears throat> this long linker um, um, then binds to two other ZPN and ZPC domains um, and really stretches and, and has a long connectivity along the filament. And that has very in interesting implications also on the polymerization mechanism because um, um, just based on that structure, you can now think about uh, different ways of how this uromodulin can polymerize um, before it is cleaved by this protease hepsin. But, but this is really something that, um, uh, that has to be explored. And I also would like to mention that there's another lab, um, the lab of Luca Jovin um, um, uh, in, in Sweden. Um, they also posted a, a paper with a, with a very similar structure of uromodulin um, on bioarchive who also came up with, a, with, a, with an assembly mechanism. But um, this could be interesting maybe for your field because now that we have an atomic structure of this backbone, uh, one might be able to really look into specific mutations and whether or not they are involved in the polymerization of the protein. And in fact, in that paper, um, the group of Rudy and, and also Eric was involved, um, did already some of this analysis. So that's just uh, something I, I wanted to mention where um, my lab was not the main driver, but it, it could be interesting for the field. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Martin, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Um, everybody's quietly clapping. <laughs> uh, this is the um, uh, tough part about the virtual uh, lecture that one cannot express their enthusiasm by truly clapping, but uh, I think we all are. Uh, this was a great tour de force and it's really very, very interesting work. And I think what you ended with, of course, is very interesting to the community because mapping specific mutations and trying to understand uh, how they affect the structure of polymerization and aggregation of uromodulin um, of course, from our perspective, also inside cells, not just in the outside, um, is also very uh, important from the perspective of the uh, pathogenic mechanism. So that's, that's really um, terrific. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask, and it's um, kind of relevant to your work, and I'll see if there's any other questions in the Q&A uh, or in the chat. Uh, people can feel free to ask, and I'll try to moderate. Um, but the, the question I have is, you know, as you're probably aware, uh, your modulin is also a major GWAS hit for ki kidney disease. It's actually mm -hmm. one of the most prominent ones. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that um, it's correlated with higher levels of your modulin, both in the blood, detected in the blood, as well as in the urine. Yeah. Um, and I guess the question I have is, um, you know, in most cases, this is... Um, uh, SNPs that are in the promoter, so they're regulatory SNPs, so it's kind of hard to know exactly, you know, we would need to study to understand exactly how they affect your modulin. But the fact that they correlate with higher amounts in the blood and in the urine, um, theoretically, based on the work that you have done, this should be a plus. You know, there should be, you know, antibacterial activity, there should be sort of benefit coming from that. And yet it clearly seems to correlate with a progressive decline in kidney function. So have you ever thought about how the filaments could be disadvantageous in some ways or any, any speculation or thoughts about that? Um, so, so what we sometimes see, especially also in, in, in urine, and I think from Eric, we also sometimes, we also, or from, from Olivier, we also analyzed some, some uh, urine from uh, mice. Um, what we sometimes see is, is also a really a, like a, 
a very dense mesh or network formation of Euromodulin. And we, we kind of wondered or speculated whether this can be somehow um, uh, significant for also this cast formation that, that, uh, that exists for, for, for Euromodulin. So, um, but we have not explored which factors would, would favor that or, or disfavor that. What, what we did look into somewhat, uh, at least through the Glockshubers group, was that they uh, looked at um, um, the different uh, uh, genotypes uh, from, from different donors, um, whether they were moderate producers or high producers, and they looked whether, for example, there was a difference in the average length of the filament but um, in those experiments, as far as I remember, there was no, no obvious difference um, in not, 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 not in the structure, but also not in, in, the, in the average length of those filaments, yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. I see that Tony has a question in the chat. Um, we're running a few minutes behind, um, but uh, just quickly then, um, any thoughts on the ZP domain's contribution to the structure of your modulin? Uh, versus how ZP domains uh, contribute to the covering of human um, egg cells, the ova cells? Um, uh, to be honest, uh, since um, your modulin is, is not usually a topic I'm working on, I'm not very familiar with, um, with the function of, of uh, these ZP domains in, in, in those ovary cells. Yeah, I, I can't answer the question. It's it's interesting. Thank you. Martin, this has been wonderful. Again, we're very grateful for your um, presentation. And it's really just interesting to see kind of a structural biologist's perspective on a protein that we all um, are very interested in. And it's a rather complex uh, protein, as, as we have all uh, seen. So there's uh, much more to do to understand how it participates in both pathogenic as well as um, beneficial effects uh, on human biology. So it's uh, really very interesting. Thank you so much for, for coming today. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. <laughs> Terrific. And so it's actually a natural progression um, to our next uh, uh, topic. Um, Eric Ollinger is here with us. Um, he obviously hails from Zurich as well uh, and has worked with Olivier de Vries for quite some time, but is now, as I understand, in Newcastle um, in England, uh, working with John Sayer there. Um, and he will be giving us an update on um, his uh, perspectives on ADPKD UMOD. And the only little thing that I wanted to say is that um, the fact that I'm um, bilingual, you know, almost everyone knows that I'm originally from Greece, is because I spent certain formative years at Cragside Primary School in Newcastle up on Tyne, which is where my parents worked for some time. So I have a connection to Newcastle. Uh, I think John might appreciate that too. No Geordie accent though. It somehow switched over the years, probably luckily for me. <laughs> So uh, that's my connection to Newcastle. Eric, uh, welcome, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. So I will try to share the screen. Okay. Can you hear me and can you see the screen? It's perfect. And you can put it in presentation mode if you will. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So um, Anna, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you very much to you and Tony for the organization of this uh, wonderful webinar. So as you uh, said correctly, I was doing my doctoral thesis in Zurich and I was working on Euromodulin and I'm now working with John Sayer in, uh, in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. So what I want to do is uh, to give an, uh, an overview of uh, Euromodulin and its involvement in monogenic disease, so in ADTKD, and it will be much more a clinical uh, perspective than, than the talk that you had uh, before. So I will briefly introduce ADTKD um, as this is the first talk about this, and also introduce um, some aspects that might be relevant for ADTKD um, about Euromodulin. And then we will focus on a subtype of ADTKD, which is ADTKD UMOD, which is caused by mutation in the UMOD gene. And we will speak about clinical and genetic spectra, um, some recent insights to prognostic factors and clues to diagnosis. So um, ADTKD, which is really a clinical entity, is associated with um, a specific findings, both clinical findings and um, histopathological findings. So as the name indicates, um, it features an autosomal dominant inheritance and is associated with a progressive loss of kidney functions, uh, typically um, with end-stage kidney disease around adulthood. The, um, we find the blunt urine sediment and at least initially 
an uh, absence of proteinuria. And there have been reports that later on, you might see secondary um, effects like FSGS, which generate proteinuria in the later stages of the disease. Um, in contrast to AD, PKD, the kidneys are usually um, normal or small sized, and we might see some extra renal features for some mutations, as you will see. On the histopathological side, um, the typical findings are interstitial fibrosis with tubular atrophy, and it might be that in the case of ADTKD humod, there are some alterations of the tubular basement membranes that are observed. And in 2015, there's been a CADICO uh, consensus conference, and I think one of the important takeaways that for the diagnostic criteria, as these are so a specific disease, diseases, so to put a definitive diagnosis for ADTKD, it is mandatory to have a um, genetic mutation. So, so the genetic um, testing is really very important for this kind of diseases, and it is required to put the diagnosis. So over the years, a couple of um, both nuclear genes, but also mitochondrial genes, have been associated with ADTKD-like presentations. And um, so I will speak about the, the human gene, and you will hear about Mark one um, directly after this. And the consensus for the nomenclature is really to, um, uh, to add the, the gene that is causal for the disease after the uh, ADTKD. And so it's really a big advance in the field to have a uh, unified um, terminology, which really helps us the clinician. Um, so you might know that before ADTKD, UMOD was referred to as um, medullary cystic kidney disease type 2 or uh, familial juvenile hyperuricemic nephropathy. But this, especially the, the, the former one, we really miss. miss uh, Nomifications and, and that's not helped in the advancement of the disease. So, as you have heard before, um, the, the gene pro so the protein product, uromodulin, or um, is also referred to as Tam Horsfall protein, and is a product of the kidney. So, it's only produced in the kidney. And for those that are not very familiar with this, if you zoom, so if you zoom out in the, the kidney, you have the functional unit, which is the, the nephron which is filtering blood to produce pro-urine um, and has different segments of this nephron. And one of the segments, as I alluded to already by Martin before, is the thicker thin limb, which you see here, which is the unique side of production of uromodulin, which is then mainly um, excreted in the urine to be, um, so to be found in the urine. And indeed, if you, if you look in the urine um, and you, do you run a commercial gel, for instance, you see that the, the band at around 100 kilodalton is the, which is uromodulin, is the main protein that is found in um, normal urine. And in the urine, you see, as you have seen before, filamentary structure of uromodulin. So we produce every day up to 150 milligrams of uromodulin in, in a short stretch of cells in the thigathemic gland. Now, we have, we have seen already the, the biochemical aspect. I will just focus um, on this here. This is the protein domain of uromodulin which is encoded by 10 exons. And you might see that exon three is the preponderant exon, which is encoding nearly uh, all of the N-terminal side of the, of the protein. And what is interesting is that you have um, all these red dots here are in fact cysteine residues. And your modulin has 48 cysteine residues. This amounts to 8% of all the amino acids, and it is much more than of other, that we see for other proteins. Um, and this suggests that um, the folding in the ER is it's complex because all of these cysteines are engaging in, in disulfide breaches. And we also see later for the mutation that this is particularly relevant for the human disease. Um, so as mentioned, your modinin is excreted and it's forming polymers. And here just to show you a little bit less sophisticated, this is an, an IF immunofluorescence on primary uh, cells, which in this case have been derived from mice. And you see really this dense meshwork of your modulin that is produced in these cells. Now, regarding the functions, so I don't want to go too much in detail, as it has already been um, also mentioned by Martin before. Um, I want to focus on maybe three uh, primary functions that have been mostly studied in knockout uh, mouse mod models. So the first is that your modulin in the segments where it's expressed, so mainly the tiger tending limb, but also the initial part of the distal convoluted tubule, is modulating um, the function of apically expressed salt transporters such as the tyrosine responsive NCC or loop diuretic responsive NKCC2 in the thigathending limb, and thereby is modulating the reabsorption of salt in these segments. There has been um, 
more recent studies that are interested in the um, somewhat weaker release of uromodulin at the basolateral side of the cells, where it then enters the interstitium. And the this in mouse models has been shown to modulate um, the inflammatory response and the rep repair after acute kid injury of proximal tubular segments, which are in very close vicinity with the sick offending limb. And from there, it might also enter in the bloodstream and have some systemic roles in the blood. And then the last and probably very important function is the protection against different kinds of um, urinary tract uh, pathogens, as you have heard before. Now, the human gene um, has gained some notoriety in the nephrology field because it's one of these rare examples of genes that have been involved in the, in the whole spectrum of genetic disease. So you have, as mentioned already, you have common variants um, in the promoter region of UMOD, which are modulating the expression uh, of uromodulin, and which have, via GWAS, has been associated with complex traits. So these are usually a um, low effect size around OS ratio 1.2 for CKD, uh, to give an example. And at the other extreme, we have rare mutations, um, which are associated with classic Mendelian disease. This is ADTKD UMOD, what we will speak uh, about now. And the fact really that um, uromodulin is associated with, with this whole spectrum of diseases suggests that it is probably important uh, for physiology and homeostasis of the kidney. Now, ADTKD UMOD was first described by um, Anthony Blyer in 2002, and shortly after, also families have been described in, uh, in Belgium and France. And we see here one of the first pedigrees. So you see that it's really an autosomal dominant inheritance insofar that every uh, generation is affected. These and you have 50% then of the offspring uh, which are affected. We, for this talk, not go too much into the, the physiopathological pathways that have been described mostly also in, in mouse models. Also because in the end, it is not yet clear what is the main driver of kidney disease. What what is clear is that probably the primo movement of the disease is an um, ER retention of mutant uromodulin. And from this results ER stress and then secondary, probably secondary alterations, which involve so um, metabolic alterations with mitochondrial dysfunctions, but also autophagy defects. And we see here, um, just to, to, to highlight this, we see here nephrectomy sampled of normal human kidney, and we see that uromodulin is mainly at the apical site. But in this biopsy here from an, or this nephrectomy sample from an ATKD human patient, you see this, this very strong cytoplasmic staining. Um, and if you go more in detail by EM, we see that there is storage material, so fibrillar storage material into the ER, which are, which are uh, hyperplastic. And so it's really an ER storage disease. Um, but again, the, the pathway after this ER storage are not yet completely uh, clear. Now, um, what is the prevalence of ATKD UMOD? Um, if, we, if we base on this study uh, that was um, uh, carrying out NGS, in more than 3,000 patients with very advanced uh, CKD, um, they found that 0.3% of their patients with end-stage kidney disease had a mutation in, in UMOD. And so this is probably quite conservative, but if you do these calculations, the whole population, we come around prevalence of one in 70,000. But as mentioned, this might be on the conservative end because other um, single center studies found a much higher prevalence of UMOD in a, in a population of, of patients with end-stage kidney disease. Um, so together with um, Anthony Blyer from, from Wake Forest, we have, uh, we have run a retrospective cohort study to investigate more in detail these diseases. And uh, we used uh, the Caligo inclusion criteria for the suspicion of ADTKD diagnosis. And we, we pulled together the data on our families that we had. And together with so European centers and American centers, we had a total of 585 ADTKD families. And most of these families then were, have been screened for um, the UMOD gene. And um, 216 families were positive, so for, for ADTKD UMOD. And most of the uh, families that were negative for UMOD were then screened with the help of the Broad Institute for the involvement of, of Mark one And we had another 72 Mark one families. Um, and also interestingly, 133 index patients remained without a diagnosis after excluding UMOD and Mark one And so based on these prevalences, at least in this, this cohort, um, 
we can estimate that the prevalence of UMOT inside ADTKD is um, roughly um, is, is 37 percent, and Mach 1 is a bit less common, is um, 20 percent. But a lot of these patients remain um, without genetic diagnosis uh, to date. Now, regarding the genetic aspects of ADTKD UMOT, um, so there are three interesting uh, observations. So these are all the mutations described to date, both in our cohort, but also in literature and in HGMD. And the first thing that you can observe is that there's a striking clustering of the mutations to the N-terminal side of the protein domain. So it's very rare to find mutations on the, Z, on the, on the C-terminal, so not by the C there, um, domain of the protein. And the second observation is that most of these mutations are uh, missense changes, seen here, and there are only a handful of indels that are described. And among them, an, an insertion deletion that is very common in the UK. So this is probably something that arrives from the UK to the, to the US. And the third observation is that um, over half of the mutations involve a cysteine residue. So we have seen before that cysteines are very, um, are very prevalent, uh, probably important for folding, and they are very, and virtually every cysteine, cysteine of UMOT is involved in a mutation that gives rise to an uh, um, to disease, but it's very rare to find this in population genetic data, like in LOMOT. So they are really patho pathogenic. From the clinical perspective, so we were comparing um, ADTKD UMOT with ADTKD Mark one and there are, there are, I think, two important um, messages here. So the first is regarding end-stage kidney disease, um, which is more prevalent in ADTKD UMOT. But we also see that the renal outcome is worse for um, patients with ADTKD Mach 1 with a median age to end stage kidney disease with 46 years. Uh, and for UMOT, it is uh, 54 years, so nearly 10 years more. And then what I don't show here, but um, an ADTKD UMOT diagnosis is still associated with a worse prognosis than persons without a genetic diagnosis, which have in general a better uh, prognosis. And these findings um, reflect also findings from, uh, from the court that have been published before in, in Spain, Rosa Torre, who also showed that, um, that, that Mark 1 was tendentially associated with a more severe renal outcome. And the second um, observation is regarding gout, which is both mo more prevalent in LTGD UMOT, with around 80% prevalence, but also um, is earlier in LTGD UMOT, with age 2 um, to gout onset in the median with 30 years for ADTKD UMOT and 67 years for ADTKD Mach 1. So it seems to be associated with, with the UMOT mutation. And this is true both for males but also for females, interestingly. Now, an interesting aspect um, of ADTKD UMOT is its large variability of disease progression, which is, for instance, much more uh, pronounced than for other diseases like ADPKD. And we see that. Um, this variability holds true or is, is observed both inside the same families. So this means these are mutation independent factors, but to a certain extent, um, the mutation of UMOT gene is also influencing the outcome, as has been shown in this retrospective study before that certain mutations um, give a more severe phenotype, especially if they are in different domains of UMOT, like the EGF, like domain two and three, when apparently they are seeded with a more severe um, outcome. And you could reproduce some of these findings in our UK database of UMOT patients. And um, I think this is a very interesting and important topic. And very recently, um, an, an, a large collaborative effort driven by um, Anthony Blyer has investigated more in detail these aspects and was investigated whether genetic factors or clinical factors could predict um, kidney outcomes. And so, quite interestingly, um, they could show there's a good correlation between the behavior of the mutation um, in vitro, so in cell systems, and the clinical uh, prognosis. So you see here that um, we see that here the ER retention of mutant urmotulin, I see uh, here, um, the higher the score, the more humor is retained, and the more severe is the uh, clinical prognosis, or the, more, the, or the earlier is ancient kidney disease. So there seems to be good correlation for these mutation factors. But there are also clinical factors associated with ancient kidney disease. So they could confirm that the male gender was associated with earlier end-stage kidney disease, but also the parental age 
um, of end-stage kidney disease was associated with renal outcomes. And interestingly, especially the maternal age was associated with outcomes. So very interesting study that uh, I encourage you to read. So the, the last part um, of this presentation, we were also um, going back to tissue samples in this cohort. And um, we could, for instance, here confirm the accumulation of, of, of UMOT that you see here um, with the broad cytoplasmic staining in the biopsy of an atypical UMOT patient. Um, and this, this co-localizes with an um, upregulated GRP78, which is an ER chaperon, and its upregulation um, suggests that there is an ER stress going on. Um, and we did not find these findings in ATKD Mark 1. So we did not find GRP78 upregulated, and we did not find UMOD um, in a cytoplasmic fashion. So the UMOD appeared normal in biopsies or in, in nephrectomy samples from Mark 1 patients. We also investigated um, urinary uromodulin levels, and you see here expressed, so normalized to create in the urine and to EGFR, and you have access to a large reference population um, in Switzerland. And what we can see is that in ADTKD Mark 1, these levels in the urine do not really seem to be altered. However, as already described before, we see consistently that patients with the UMOD mutation have reduced levels of UMOD in the urine. This is corrected again for uh, EGFR. So there are two important information, I think. So the first is that the trafficking or the handling of uh, uromodulin does not seem to be altered in ATKD Mark 1. And secondly, um, we could use this information here to modulate our pretest probability for these two diseases or to help to differentiate these two diseases. And so we were wondering whether clinical factors and biochemical factors could help us to differentiate both between non ADTKD and ADTKD, but also inside ADTKD between remote and Mark 1 assessed. And you could see, so here on the left, you have the UMOT positive and MOC1 positive patients, and um, that clinical score, scoring alone using the CADIGO um, criteria, but also insights from, from the cohort study, um, can give us already two information. So if the clinical score is low, in this case here under five, and again, these are clinical characteristics such as um, CKD, such as family history, so basic ADTKD criteria, um, we can we, we do not see a lot of patients. So this means that it's probably not ADTKD. So the first so the first information and we are here is that then probably you have to revise your diagnosis. And the second thing is that if this score is very high, um, this is probably reflected by factors like an early onset gout, um, then it's, it's likely that it's that it's UMOT and not Mark 1. And then we go and decide here of the score. But what we also saw is that it's quite difficult on clinical grounds to separate more than Mark 1. And in, this, in these conditions here, if we, if we take into account urinary urmodulin levels, we, re, we really um, manage quite well to separate uh, Umod and Mark 1 with um, quite good um, predictive and so positive and negative predictive values for this. And so we suggest oh, that this is an interesting tool to, um, to modulate the pretest probability for this disease. Just the last word about um, the, the therapy. So there's no specific therapy for um, ADTKD UMOD. Um, the only curative aspect to say is um, renal transplantation. And um, so a study uh, driven by Peter Conlon from Ireland um, showed that indeed um, renal transplantation for different kinds of different subtypes of ADTKD has a good, um, good prognosis in terms of graft and patient survival, at least no different to other causes of end-stage kidney disease, and that there is, of course, as expected, no recurrence of the disease in the graft. So to date, the mainstay of therapy remains um, a timely planning of kidney transplantation, as we know that, um, that these patients will evolve um, slowly to end-stage kidney disease. So it's important to, to test um, relatives and to plan, if possible, a um, living donation of kidney transplantation, and the rest is supportive management of CKD and if present, um, extra renal complications like such as gout. So with this, I would um, like to, to summarize, so to, to remind that the presentation of these diseases, is of, of these clinical entities are specific. And so probably where we have first estimates for UMOD, the overall prevalence of ADTKD remains 
um, underestimated and genetic testing is really important um, for this disease. Humot appears to be the main cause for ADTKD and is associated um, with uh, early gout, but generally a little bit less severe renal outcome than ADTKD Mark 1. Um, and the large variability that we see suggests modifiers, and there are probably genetic modifiers that remain to be discovered. Um, and we suggest that score, a clinical score coupled with biochemical data could help to differentiate non ADTKD from ADTKD and also inside this group between Umod and Mach 1. And um, the fact that we still are not very, not sure about the main physiopathological axis driving CKD um, is probably reflected by the fact that there are no specific therapies available today for this disease. So, with this, um, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, attention. Um, I would like to thank um, John Sayer and his lab for their support, but also um, uh, Olivier De Voice and, uh, and, and Patrick Hoffman, who have been instrumental in the court study. I would, of course, like to thank um, Anthony Blyer and Kendra Kitt, who are amazing uh, collaborators, and for all of the help. The Broad Institute for uh, Mac 1 testing. Um, I would like to thank Luca Rampoldi and Celine Schaeffer from uh, San Rafael in Milano, who have a large knowledge about um, the pathogenicity of mutations and in vitro systems, and who are very helpful for this. Um, all the referring physicians for um, giving us this information, and of course the patients um, for agreeing to be included into this, um, these studies, which in the end, uh, hopefully, we will come back and, and give insight into disease and find therapies in the long run. Um, and the founding agencies, of course. And I'd be happy to take um, your questions. Thank you, Eric. This was a wonderful presentation. Again, virtual clapping from everyone. Um, in the interest of time, you have three really great questions in the Q&A, which you can probably see. Um, in the interest of time, may I ask you to answer them, type them, and we can all see the answers and have a dialogue in the, in the Q&A while we also queue up um, the next talk because we are running about 10, 12 minutes late. It's always happening, that's not a big deal, um, but just trying to catch up a little bit so that we don't keep people up um, too late in other parts of the world. Um, so thank you again. Uh, without further ado, I wanted to um, introduce Valeria Padovano as our next speaker. Uh, Valeria uh, trained with Mike Kaplan at Yale before I had the great luck of recruiting her to my team at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Uh, she has extensive experience in cell biology uh, with a focus on PKD and now applies her talents uh, to the study of Mach 1. So Valeria, thank you and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity today to give you some uh, updates on our progress in the understanding of the biology of mac one associated kidney disease. And I'm not, I don't need to go into details for the uh, introduction on ADTKD. So I'm just gonna give you uh, a few highlights on mac one associated kidney disease. The disease is inherited as an autosomal dominant genetic disease of the kidney and is caused by mutations in the MAC1 gene. Uh, the uh, hallmark of this disease, as you can see here in this biopsy from an MKD patient, is tubular uh, damage and interstitial fibrosis that eventually uh, leads to kidney failure and end-stage renal disease. And the average uh, age of onset of end-stage renal disease is between 50 and 60 years of age. Uh, regarding treatment, there is currently no pharmacological treatment for this disease, and the only uh, options for patients with mac one associated kidney disease are uh, dialysis or kidney transplantation. So today I'm going to walk you through the genetic cause of the disease. And then we are going to dive into the, our updates on the biological mechanism of the disease. And finally, I'll give you uh, some uh, interesting updates regarding a potential pharmacological treatment for MAC1 kidney disease. So the genetic cause of this disease, as the name suggests, are mutations in the MAC1 gene. And these mutations uh, were, it took a while to actually identify them. They were identified at the broad in 2013. And the reason why it was so difficult to find them 
is that this mutation occur in a variable number of thunder repeat region or VNTR. And this region is um, characterized by um, high, uh, highly repetitive sequence with a very high GC content. content. And as you can imagine, this um, G high GC content and repetition makes it really hard to sequence this region of the gene. The mutation itself is a duplication of a cytosine in the VNTR region. And this mutation results in a frame shift, as you can see here in this scheme, uh, and an early stop codon. So the protein will be the same uh, from the end terminus up to this frame shift mutation, and there will be a completely different protein with an early um, stop codon. The product of the MAC1 gene is, is mucin one and mucin one is a membrane protein that localizes on the apical side of epithelial cells. And the protein after its uh, um, translation in the ER, well, it, it is highly glycosylated due, while it's traversing the Golgi. And this glycosylation of the protein results in a dense hydrophilic negatively charged coat, which provides lubrication for, um, for the epithelium and also uh, provides a barrier from the uh, attack of the pathogens to protect the epithelium. So while the wild type protein localize, localizes on the membrane, the mutant frame shifted MAC1 protein localizes intracellularly. And you can see here in this uh, nice um, immunohistochemistry from a patient with MKD that the wild type protein here is nicely localized on the apical surface of these tubular cells, while the mutant protein is retained uh, intracellularly here. And you can see this even better in this immunofluorescence of patient-derived uh, renal cells, where the wild type protein is stained in red here on the membrane, and the mutant protein, as you can see in green, is localized in this dot-like pattern inside the cell. So we wanted to know more about what is the biological mechanism that is responsible for the disease. And we can break down these questions in two main questions. What is the consequence of having this mutant protein accumulating inside the cells? And where and how is Mach 1 frame shift retained in the cells? And in our lab, we developed different tools to study the disease. And one of the tools that we have is a, mu is a mouse model that expresses a knock-in uh, Mach 1 FS mutation, the human mutation. And you can see here in these two sections, the wild type kidney uh, on the left. And when we looked at the mutant uh, kidney on the right, we can see that there's this area uh, between the cortex and the medulla that presents with a large tubule. And this is the area where our mutant Mach 1 protein is expressed. So it also phenocopies what I showed you at the beginning on the histology of the patients. And when we found when we look at this area that expresses the mutant protein, if we do a tunnel staining to look for apoptotic cells, what we see is that over time, these mice uh, develop an increased number of apoptotic cells in this area. So here in the graph, you can see uh, we followed mice at different time points. So we have a four month of age and a 12 month of age. And over time, we see this increase in the apoptotic cells. Another model that we have in the lab are patient-derived kidney cells. And you can see, you can see here in these um, panels. And we have the patient-derived and the normal uh, patient-derived kidney cells. And these cell lines were isolated and immortalized the same way. So can, we can use them as the mutant and control cell line. And when we look at these cells, we also wanted to see if there was an increased uh, apoptosis. And when we look here in the control cells, we don't really see a difference between the normal cells and the patient cells. But if we induce ER stress by treating the cells with tapsigargine, which uh, depletes the ER calcium stores and does inducing uh, ER stress, now we see that the cells coming from the patient, so the cells with the mutant protein, show an increased number of apoptotic cells, which indicates that cells that do express the mutant MAC1 are more susceptible to ER uh, stress-induced um, cell death. So the other, so now I told you what is the effect of having this mutant protein inside the cells. So, but where is this protein exactly? 
So we, to answer this question, we uh, took advantage of an imaging screening uh, that looks at different uh, markers of all the organelles along the circulatory pathway. So uh, we have markers for the ER, for intermediate vesicle compartments, for the Golgi, and for the later uh, compartments. And what we did was to use, again, our uh, patient-derived kidney cells and stain for uh, the mutant MAC1 protein and also for different organelles. And we looked at the overlap between the two stainings to see exactly with which marker our mutant is um, co-localizing. And when we look at this, what we find is that the mutant MAC1 protein is actually not accumulating in the ER or in the Golgi, but is in this intermediate vesicle compartment. They actually localize in vesicles that are positive for this protein here, TMN9. And I'll talk about it a bit more later. So we saw this co-localization in our patient-derived kidney cells. And of course, we wanted to test this in our other models that we have in the lab uh, to see if this is true also in, uh, in all of these models. And so we looked again at our mouse model that expresses, expresses the mutant uh, MAC1 protein. And we did find interaction, you can see here in this bottom panel in the merged image, we do see a co-localization of uh, FSMAC1 with the uh, TMN9 protein. And this is true also in biopsies from patients here. And also we, uh, in the lab, we developed uh, uh, patient-derived kidney organoids, and we find co-localization between the mutant protein and TMN9 also in this model. So this is suggesting that the co-localization that we see is actually true and it's not just happening in the isolated uh, cells from the patients. And just a few uh, words about TMN9. Uh, TMN9 is a member of the P24 TMN family and the proteins of this family uh, have been suggested to function as cargo receptor for the incorporation of secretory molecules into vesicles. And they might also be uh, important in quality control for their cargo. These proteins have a, share a similar structure that you can see here. They have this uh, globular gold domain, which is responsible for cargo recognition. This domain is followed by coin coil domain, which is important for interactions between different TMET proteins. There is a transmembrane domain. And then there is a, a, this tiny uh, cytosolic tail, which is really important because this tail is what contains the motifs for recognition of TMET9 by the COP protein, COP1 or COP2 proteins. And this is what tells the vesicle in which direction has to move, if it has to go forward from the ER to the Golgi or backwards from the Golgi to the ER. So now we know a bit more of what happens to the cells that express MAC1FS. We know where a MAC1FS is localized, but can we do something to get rid of these protein aggregates from inside the cells? And to answer this question, we took advantage of a repurposing library at the broad of small molecules, and we developed a phenotypic screen using eye content imaging. And in this screen, we used the patient-derived kidney cells, and we measured three main parameters. We measured the amount of wild-type MAC1 that is in, present in the cells, the amount of frame-shifted MAC1, and also cell numbers, because if we identify a compound that can clear these protein aggregates, we want to make sure that this compound is not toxic. We started with uh, a bit less than 4,000 compounds in this screen. And through a series of secondary screen and profile screens, we ended up uh, isolating one compound that was really interesting to us because it had the characteristics we were looking for. And this compound, we have D4780, uh, as you can see here in this uh, immunofluorescence, is actually able to clear the, uh, the accumulated MAC1FS from the cells. And you can see here the mutant protein is in green. And what is uh, interesting is that while it is removing the mutant protein, it's leaving the wild type protein undisturbed on the cell surface. And this is quantified on this graph on the left. And we can see that there is no effect on the, uh, no reduction of the wild type protein in yellow. There is a nice reduction of the mutant protein here in green. 
And what we also saw is that this compound is not toxic and there is no uh, change in cell number across all the concentrations that we have tested in our um, screens. So this compound is really interesting because you know it, it's clearly the mutant protein, but what happens to the phenotype of these cells? And I've shown you at the beginning that the, this patient-derived uh, kidney cells are more susceptible to stress-induced um, cell death. So we wanted to know if clearing these uh, mutant protein aggregates uh, was was enough to actually rescue this stress-induced cell death in these uh, cell lines. And so we again, we treated the cell with cells with Tapsigargin to induce ER stress. And we also treated them with and without BRD4780. And you can see here in this graph, when we treat with Tapsigargin, as expected, we see a um, reduction in cell vi viability while the co-treatment uh, with BRT4780 here in black is able to rescue the um, reduction in cell viability in these cells. So this compound that removes fs one is able to also rescue this phenotype in the, in the patient-derived kidney cells. And we tested, we found this in our kidney patient-derived kidney cells. Of course, we wanted to move forward and test this compound in other models that we have in the lab. And again, we took advantage of the uh, knock-in mouse for the mutation and also uh, of patient-derived kidney organoids. And again, we can see here in green the staining for the mutant protein. And treatment with BRT4780 is able to clear this um, protein aggregate and leaves the wild-type protein uh, in the cells on the membrane where it's supposed to be. We then wonder what is the mechanism of action and the target of BRT4780. And again, in order to see what's happening to the mutant protein when we treat the cells, we took advantage of the, um, our uh, assay to co-localize the mutant protein with different um, markers of the secretory, com secretory compartments. And we looked, um, again, we quantified the amount of overlap between the protein and the markers. And you can see here we have a three hour treatment in these cells. And remember, when we look at the steady state, what we see is that the mutant protein uh, co localized with TMN9. But if we look at three hours after treatment, now the protein localizes in um, later secretory compartments, like for here is co localizing with the transcology network. And if we wait even longer, then we can find our protein in even later secretory compartments here in the early endosomes and in the lysosomes. And finding this, uh, that the compound is increasing co-localization of the mutant protein with uh, markers of the lysosomes suggests, suggested that the lysosome might be actually the station where the protein is uh, degraded. And this was uh, a new and interesting uh, concept for us because when we think about protein that accumulates and needs to be cleared, what you usually think about is the proteasome through the ERAD uh, pathway. So usually we, what we think about is the protein is exported from the ER and gets into the proteasome for degradation. What these co-localization studies were suggesting is that in our case, the protein is actually able to move forward uh, through the secretory pathway and end up in the lysosomes. So to test uh, this hypothesis, we took advantage of two drugs, Brefeldin A, which blocks trafficking from the ER to the Golgi, and we used Bafilomycin A to prevent lysosomal function. And so you can see here in this Western blot, when we treat with BRD4780, we see a reduction of MAC1FS in the patient-derived kidney cells. And if we treat with Brefeldin A, so now we are blocking the trafficking, we can see the MAC1 uh, frame shift is actually stuck in the cell, it accumulates, and we lose the effect of BRD4780. And again, if we treat with bafilomycin, if we uh, block the lysosomal function, we see the same effect. The protein cannot be degraded anymore after drug treatment. And going back um, to the co-localization with TMN9, uh, another question that we had is, 
is whether team 9 was actually preventing uh, Mark 1 FS to reach the lysosome. So is team 9 actually blocking and entrapping this protein and what happens if we get rid of it? So we generated uh, two different team 9 knockout cells in the patient derived kidney cells. And when we look already here in this Western blot, you can see that we lose the expression, we lose the um, the protein, the Mark 1 frame shifted protein. And you can see here uh, in this immunofluorescence that we do lose the, the mutant protein, but we leave the uh, wild type protein unaffected. And this is phenocopy is what we see uh, with the drug treatment here. So I've shown you that TMA9 is important for retention. So we wanted to know whether TMA9 uh, could be actually the target of the drug. And so uh, a way to answer this question is to look at um, cellular thermal shift assays. And the principle behind this assay is that when a protein binds to uh, a small molecule, it's, um, it's the denat denaturation is, um, doesn't happen. So it's protected from denaturation at higher temperatures. And so this, um, this is the experiment that we performed. So we incubated the lysates of um, the cells with PRD4780 and incubated the lysates at different increasing temperature. And you can already see here in the uh, Western blot that the treated um, sample shows protection of TMN9 from degradation. And this is quantified here. And this is suggesting that TMN9 might be the direct target uh, of the drug but also suggested that even if team 9 is not a direct target, it is definitely involved in the pathway that is targeted by the drug. So proteins can be stabilized also for different, um, because they get post-translation modification or because they are part of a complex. So it's possible that even if uh, team 9 is not our target, it's definitely involved, involved in the mechanism of action of the drug. So, we now have a compound that in, in cells and in the mouse model and in our uh, patient-derived kidney organoids is able to clear the accumulation of uh, the mutant protein. So does this represent a step forward towards something that we can actually bring to the clinic? And so if we look at uh, the properties of BRT4780, we can say that this uh, compound actually has drug-like properties. And I put here in this table uh, a few of these uh, properties that uh, our uh, medicinal chemistry group looked at. And we can, uh, you can see here that BRT4780 uh, satisfies the rule of five, which um, is an indication whether a chemical has, pro has, chemi has uh, physical and chemical properties that would make it a likely orally active drug in humans. Uh, you see here the solubility that we're looking for in a drug candidate. Uh, it has to be, uh, we, want, we would like it to be above 100 micromolar, and you can see that our solubility of our compound is 200 millimolar. This compound is highly permeable and show no efflux, and is highly stable in hepatocytes, and also is highly stable in the plasma and shows a low uh, plasma protein uh, binding. So all these characteristics together suggest that BRD4780 or a compound that would be similar to this compound might be a good candidate for a clinical trial for the disease. So to summarize, uh, today I've shown you that mac one fs accumulates in TM9 positive vesicles and they've identified a compound, BRD4780, that promotes lysosomal degradation of the mutant protein. I've also shown you that TM9 plays a role in mac one fs retention in cells. And I've shown you that TM9 or a pathway containing TM9 uh, is the target of our drug. And I've also shown you that uh, BRD4780 has drug-like pro properties, which makes it a good candidate uh, for clinical trial. And something else I would like to underline um, here at the end of the talk is that we did find this compound uh, because we were looking for something that would clear the protein aggregates from the cells. 
But these compounds actually did something more for us. It allowed us to reveal a novel pathway to clear intracellular toxic proteins. And this is uh, very interesting to us because uh, there are many diseases caused by accumulation of intracellular uh, toxic proteins and suggests that other diseases might actually uh, present with a similar mechanism and might benefit from the same treatment uh, that we uh, just found for Mark one uh, fs And the data I've shown you today are, were published last year uh, in, in cells. You can also find them uh, online. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who works on this uh, project. As you can see, there are lots of people who contributed, uh, especially like to thank, thank Anna and Moran, who, is the, who was the postdoc in the lab who did uh, the bulk of this work together with Masha in CDOT. And of course, we would like to, I would like to thank all the people in the Greca lab for their support and the patient, the MKD patient who generously donated samples and our funding sources. And I would like to leave you with a nice picture pre-COVID of our lab, hoping that we can all be in the same room again soon. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Excellent work, Valeria. Thank clap, you. clap, clap. Um, nice, nice job. Um, I did want to acknowledge that I just uh, saw that uh, Mohan Vela Levit, uh, who is the first author and has done uh, this work in collaboration with others in the group, is actually um, uh, in the uh, participants uh, in the symposium. So it's really great to, to see that. I am beyond proud of the fact that Mohan is now herself a professor um, at the Bar Ilan University uh, in Israel. And so it's uh, really uh, terrific to sort of see the the next generation uh, of scientists coming out of the group and starting their own groups and uh, looking forward to, to seeing the great things she's going to accomplish in the years ahead. Um, so uh, terrific review. In the, in the interest of time, um, I will ask that if there's any questions, we can use the Q&A. Um, and I would like to skip our designated break and just invite everyone to you know, take a break if they need to, buy a break or otherwise, um, and, uh, you know, stand up from their computer to kind of maintain postural health, I suppose. But uh, I will, um, I would like to uh, move forward so that we can cover a little bit of the lost time. Um, so uh, our next uh, speaker um, is uh, Martina Zibna um, from Stan Mox Group um, in, uh, at the University, uh, the Charles University in Prague. Um, Martina is known to many of you. She's done um, a consistently uh, excellent work together with Stan uh, and in collaboration with Tony over the many years um, in this space. And um, today she will uh, talk to us about um, renin mutations. And so we're very much looking forward to your talk, Martina. Thank you for, for coming. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hello. Uh, wait a minute, I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, just in presentation mm. mode, if you would like. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, can Perfect. you can you see it and can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thanks to organizers Anna Greca and Tony Blair, to gave me the opportunity to present our recently um, published data about ADTKD REM. Uh, my talk is um, focused on uh, autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease due to mutations in pre-prorenine. And I will focus on clinical manifestation and pathogenesis of this subgroup of ADTKD. Uh, mutations in the REN gene coding renin protein are probably the third most frequent cause of ADTKD. The history of ADTKD REN started in 2005 when we found in our set of uh, ADTKD families uh, one family atypical familial juvenile hyperuricemic nephropathy FJHN, which is one of the older term uh, of uh, ADTKD. And this family has clinical characterization. Uh, it was small kidney size, 
progressive renal insufficiency, low GFR, renal failure between 50 to 60 years of age, anemia, hyperuricemia, and mild hyperkalemia. And we detected in this family low urinary humor excretion with strongly reduced expression in, uh, of humor in kidney. So there is no accumulation of humor in kidney uh, as in case ADPKD humor. In this family, we didn't identify any humor mutations and by linkage analysis, we excluded MCKD1 locus on chromosome 1Q21. MCKD1 is medullary cystic kidney disease type 1, which is another older term for ADTKD. It's MAC1 locus. And through whole genome linkage analysis, we identified candidate locus on chromosome 1Q41. And by sequencing genes, candidate genes, we identified mutation in REN gene. We published this, this data in 2009, and during the publication process, uh, we were very lucky because we have met Tony Blair, and we started with the collaboration. And this is the first publication where you can see together Tony Blair and his team and Stan Kmoch and his team. Uh, and from that time, we published 35 joint publications. And today, we are one international clinical scientific team. In 2010, we suggested causal therapy for adtkd uh, which is administration of synthetic fludro uh, aldosterone fludrocortisone. Uh, we published the initial data about this therapy and the therapy is based on the observation of Tony Blair that patients with ADTKD REN have hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism which can contribute to, to progression of kidney failure. And from our initial papers uh, we um, obtained many questions or we were contacted by many nephrologists and geneticists, uh, especially Tony Blair and also Stan Kmoch and me, with the question about their patients with uh, renin mutations. And we collected an international cohort of ADTKD ren patients. This uh, cohort is the biggest around the world with ADTKD REN families and includes 30 families with 111 affected individuals with different, different 15 heterozygous mutations in REN gene. Uh, REN gene coding renin protein, which is synthesized as pre-pro-renin. Pre-domain coding signal peptide uh, which is responsible for translocation of nascent polypeptide chain from cytosol into the endoplasmic reticulum through the translocon, uh, followed by proper post-translational modifications. Prosegment or prodomain coding prosegment proRenin, which assists in protein folding and secretion of renin and proRenin. And the mature renin is responsible for enzymatic activity because renin is an aspartate protease. In our ADTKD REN cohort, we have 21 families with signal peptide mutations, four families with prosegment mutations, and five families with mature renin mutations. ADTKD REN patients with signal peptide or prosegment uh, have markedly decreased renin in juxtaglomerular apparatus, which is shown here, compared to control. And we detected or observed ultra location of the renin in vessel walls. Uh, so far, we didn't kidney tissue from the patients with uh, re mature renin mutation.
Uh, from our clinical and biochemical investigations of ADTKD RAN patients, one can distinguish three independent or individual uh, subtypes of ADTKD RAN due to mutation uh, location of mutation. The most severely affected are patients with signal peptide mutations. Age of presentation of the patients with signal peptide mutations is around 20, compared to mature renin group of patients where it is around 37. Almost all patients with signal peptide mutations developed childhood anemia, which is quite similar for the prosegment uh, patients, but never observed in the group of patients with mature renin mutations. And age of end-stage kidney disease is developed 10 years earlier in the patients with signal peptide mutations compared to mature renin patients. In all patients with ADTKD ran, we detected low mean plasma renin activity. It's a common for all. And our question was, uh, what um, molecular mechanisms are responsible for cellular and kidney damage? And if, these, if those mechanisms are different for individuals ADTKD RAN subtypes. So we studied or investigated uh, biosynthesis, processing and secretion of 10 representative mutations in three pro renin. We started with in silico analysis, and then we, uh, after the transient expression of ren in hex cells, we studied qualitative and quantitative forms of renin, and also enzymatic activity and intracellular localization of the renin expressed after the transient transfection. Uh, by in silico analysis, uh, we found that mutated amino acids are absolutely conserved across species, which is shown here. Then we calculated uh, signal peptide properties by the signal P software, and we found that mutations in signal peptide changed ability of signal peptide or interact, uh, ability to interact with translocon of the mutated signal peptides. And through MCAP pathogenicity classifier, we found that um, prosegment mutations and the maturanine mutations are classified either as likely benign or possibly pathogenic. In this slide, is, uh, one can see biogenesis and secretion of preprorenin, prorenin, and renin. Preprorenin is translocated across the uh, translocon into endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, within the endoplasmic reticulum is cleaved pre sequence, signal sequence, and degraded by signal peptide peptidase. And proranine is glycosylated and post-translational modificated in a, uh, during the pathway through ergic ER Golgi intermediate compartment into the Golgi. And from Golgi is renin secreted either by constitutive or regulated pathway. By the constitutive pathway is secreted enzymatically inactive proranine which could be subsequent activates by the cleavage of prosegment. And by the regulated pathway through the lysosome is secreted enzymatically already active renin. So we, um, from Western blood and immunodetections uh, of the cell lysates uh, in wild type, we detected three forms of the renin with molecular weight uh, corresponds to prorenin, which is shown here, preprorenin and renin. This preprorenin less abundant. 
In culture media from wall type, we detected only fluorenin. The deletion of leucin-16 partially allowed partial translocation and reduced secretion of the fluorenin into the culture media, while the other missense mutations in signal peptide uh, present in cell lysate mostly as a preprorenin, which is not translocated, not processed, and not secreted into culture media. The mutations in prosegment led to synthesis of three forms of renin similar to valtide, but affected secretion of the prorenin into culture media, especially in case M39K mutation. Mutations in mature renin uh, led to synthesis of the, of the renin with molecular weight correspond to prorenin, which is not secreted into culture media. And our subsequent experiments uh, investigated amount of synthesized and secreted renin and enzymatic activity of the, of the expressed renin. So the quantitative immunoradiometric assay showed that mutant deletion leucin-16 led to reduced synthesis of renin and also prorenin, uh, and uh, which correspond to reduced secretion of the renin and prorenin into culture media. The other mutations in signal peptide uh, led to synthesis inactive uh, renin and prorenin. So we didn't detect any, any renin and prorenin by the antibody used in this quantitative immunoradiometric assay, which correspond with uh, no renin and prorenin in the culture media. The mutations in prosegment of the renin uh, have no effect for synthesis or marginal effect, but affected secretion of both renin and prorenin into culture media. The mutant or mutations in mature renin led to synthesis of the protein of the renin, which is not detectable or inactive uh, by the antibody used in this assay. And from enzymatic activity assay, we found that uh, deletion of leucine 16 led to synthesis of, uh, of the reduced enzymatic activity of renin and prorenin, uh, which uh, the, the signal peptide mutations led to synthesis or Mm, completely abolished enzymatic activity of, uh, of secreted renin and prorenin. The, the mutations in prosegment uh, either reduced enzymatic activity or led to synthesis of, I would say, hyperactive prorenin, uh, uh, which is secreted into culture media. And it's uh, for the M39K variant or mutation. The mutations in mature renin uh, completely abolished enzymatic activity of the synthesized protein or secreted protein. So our next level of the investigation of, uh, of, the, of the mutations in renin is intracellular uh, localization of preprorenin. So we um, co-localized uh, preprorenin, prorenin, and renin with individual compartments uh, along um, processing way of the of the renin. So it, we co-localized uh, renin with endoplasmic reticulum, ergic, Golgi apparatus, with lysosome, and also plasma membrane. Uh, the mutations. Uh, in, mature, uh, in mature renin led to synthesis of the protein of the renin, which is accumulated 
in endoplasmic reticulum, which is shown here. The last column are colocalization maps of individual signal of renin and endoplasmic reticulum. And here one can see nicely colocalization, nice colocalization. So this result correspond with Western blood results because we, we detected um, synthesized prorenin, but no secretion into culture media. We didn't detect any colocalization with wild type or signal peptide mutants. Here uh, you can see one representative mutation and also prosegment mutants didn't colocalize this endoplasmic reticulum. The colocalization study of the synthesized renin uh, with ER Golgi intermediate compartment showed partial colocalization with prosegment mutants, which is shown here. And it's again nicely uh, correspond with the, with the Western blood analysis, uh, where we detected in uh, cell lysates three forms of renin similar to wild type, but reduced secretion into culture media. We didn't observe any colocalization of wild type and ergic or signal peptide mutants or maturenin mutants with ergic. Uh, from the colocalization uh, with the lysosome, we observed partial colocalization with wild type, uh, which uh, would be expected because the, um, the wild type renin must go through the lysosome for the proper or during the proper processing. And we also uh, detected partial colocalization of the lysosome with the prosegment mutants. We didn't observe any colocalization with the mature renin muta mutants uh, because as we know, uh, the maturenin mutants are retained in endoplasmic reticulum. And we never observed any colocalization of the lysosome and missense mutations in signal peptide, which is shown here, while the mutant deletion of leucine 16 partially colocalized with the lysosome. And it's again correspond with the, with the Western blood analysis because only deletion of leucine 16 allowed partial translocation, processing and reduced expression of, of this mutant. We didn't observe any colocalization with the, with the plasma membrane or any differences in Golgi colocalization. So the functional studies revealed three distinct pathogenetic mechanisms due to position of mutation in free prorenin. The signal peptide mutants led to synthesis of free prorenin, which is not translocated, not processed and not secreted. This mechanism is similar to ADTKD due to translocon mutations, because in this subgroup of the, the ADTKD, the translocation is aberrant. The, the mature renin mutants uh, led, or mutations led to synthesis of the renin, which is accumulated in endoplasmic reticulum. And this mechanism is similar to ADTKD UMOT. And prosegment mutants led to synthesis of the protein, which is partly accumulated in ergic and uh, led to aberrant secretion of the prorenin and the renin. All of these three mechanisms activate ER stress of juxtaglomerular apparatus cell, which leads to apoptosis, fib fibrosis and kidney failure. And taken together from our clinical or our clinical and laboratory studies revealed three subtypes of ADTKD REN that are pathophysiologically, diagnostically, and clinically distinct. The signal peptide mutations are represented in our ADTKD cohort in 62% of the families. The disease or um, this 
subtype of ADTKD ran uh, have the most severe curse of the disease. The age of onset is around 20 with childhood anemia and end stage kidney disease around 53 years of age. The prosegment mutations are represented in our ADTKD ran cohort in 27%. The, the curse of the disease is similar to signal peptide group. And the maturenine uh, mutations are represent in 15% of ADTKD ran uh, with age of onset around 37. Never, uh, they never, the patients never develop uh, childhood anemia and end stage kidney disease is around 64. The curse of the disease is much mild, milder compared to signal peptide uh, group of patients. So thank you to, uh, to your attention and uh, I would like to thanks to my colleague, uh, especially to Stan Kmoch, Petr Vileťal, Veronika Barešová, Káča Hodaňová and many others and also Tony Blair lab team uh, which are not only colleagues, but also friends, uh, to Tony Blair, Kendra Kitt, Vicky Robbins, so they are amazing uh, collaborators. And I would like to thank also all of the co-authors of this international cohort study of ADTKD ran because this is the great example how powerful is collaboration uh, of, of, the, of the people. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martina. Uh, this was fantastic and a great overview of what we know about the renin mutation. So that's really terrific. And as you say, a testament to collaboration. Uh, in keeping with our kind of attempt at an accelerated timeline, I will ask people to put questions in the Q&A and uh, to move on to our next talk, um, our next speaker. Um, is Peter Harris, who of course needs no introduction. He's a very well-known and extremely uh, highly regarded um, scientist um, and geneticist, uh, professor of medicine and uh, biochemistry at um, the Mayo. Um, Peter Harris is uh, the recipient of the highest honor of the American Society of Nephrology, the Homer Smith Award for his uh, really remarkable contributions to our understanding of kidney function. Uh, and he has made uh, amazing contributions uh, to the PKD space uh, but today we have actually asked him to give us an update on uh, a different uh, set of mutations that um, appear to cause um, a kidney disease quite similar to the other diseases we are speaking of today. Uh, and I'm incredibly grateful to you, Peter, for being with us today. Um, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me and see the slides? I can hear you well. The slide is half, half there. Maybe if you put it in presentation mode, would... Okay, maybe I can just walk it over to... Somehow it's, um, half of it is obstructed by something. I can only see half of it. Is that better? Unfortunately not. Peter, it might be helpful to stop sharing the screen and then reshare again with your slide deck. I'll try that. Ah, this looks good. Um, and can you put it in, is there a place to put it in presentation mode? Um, uh, use slideshow up top maybe? I'm clicking you use slideshow there. Yep, up top left, yeah, there you go. That, that should do it. Great. Excellent. That's perfect. You know? <laughs> that looks perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So it's, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, DNA JB11 associated uh, kidney disease. So uh, I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about the kidney disease as associated with DNA JB11. 
um, uh, the genetic evidence for that, and also what we think might be the mechanism of, uh, of the disease. So I had to introduce another uh, AD, PKE, AD kidney disease, and that's the AD PKD here. Um, this is a, a very common uh, kidney disorder, uh, as you know, and uh, I think the, you know, the major difference with uh, the TKD is that the, the cyst uh, development here and the enlargement of the kidney are the characteristics of the disease, although there's still some fibrosis um, as the disease develops at later ages. So we've been interested in this kind of 7% or so of 80 PKD patients that have not have uh, mutations to the major genes, PKD1 and uh, PKD2. And in work that uh, Emily Cornack Legal did when she was here at, uh, at Mayo, this was an international collaboration looking at uh, something like 600 of these families that were not resolved uh, with uh, PKD1 or PKD2 uh, mutations. And we did um, whole exome sequencing on a rather small number and then followed up with a, 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 a panel analysis of uh, candidate genes, known and candidate genes. So this was the first family that uh, we identified here. And you can see the kidney disease is, is uh, somewhat distinctive and you might say somewhere between ADPKD and ADTKD with uh, numerous uh, but very small cysts and the kidneys are not really enlarged. And, but you can see that the older patient here has a decline in renal function. So this was a missense chain. So we weren't sure if there was an absolute um, uh, cause of the, the disease from the whole exome sequencing. But then collaborations with Steam Somler's uh, group um, identified a, another a family with a DNA JB11 uh, truncating mutation. But in this case, the, the phenotype was rather different. We could see there was rather predominant polycystic uh, liver disease, at least in one of these patients, although the kidney disease uh, is, uh, continues to be pretty mild. This protein was a, a good candidate because it's in this uh, pathway we've been talking about associated with the folding and the trafficking of a uh, membrane <clears throat> and secreted proteins. And here is a co-chaperone uh, with BIP. And I highlight these other proteins here because these have been associated with ADTK, ADPKD or with uh, polycystic liver disease. This just shows some other families from the initial uh, presentation of, of, this, uh, of this disease. And we can see this one has mainly cortical cysts here. Uh, this one has uh, um, more uh, cysts, but again, the, the kidneys are not enlarged. And that's really a characteristic of each of these. And our conclusion from the, uh, this initial study was that the, the disease was something of a hybrid between ADPKD and ADTKD. Recently, uh, in, a, in a project uh, that's been led by uh, Emily, we've uh, published uh, many more families now with um, DNA, DNA, <coughs> DNA JB11 associated uh, kidney disease. And I just highlight a couple of the families that, that came from the cohort in uh, at Mayo here. So you can see this is a, a truncating uh, mutation. You can see that the cystic disease, in this case, well, it's uh, dominated by one very large cyst, otherwise it's quite small cyst, but this patient also has quite significant PLD as well. And then the daughter, uh, you can see, or maybe you can see in the ultrasound, has uh, a many uh, sort of medium-sized cysts. In another family, the, the presentation looks a little more like ADTKD. We can see that there's four affected uh, siblings here, each with a, a decline in uh, renal function. And uh, we can see here the presentation uh, here with uh, multiple cysts, but uh, smaller kidneys. Again, here, um, multiple cysts with small kidneys. But interestingly, in this individual, the presentation 
was uh, um, of small kidneys, but there wasn't really uh, visible cysts within, uh, within the kidney. And this just shows uh, some of the more uh, other patients from, uh, from the, that study. You can see again, uh, the overall presentation here is of kidney staying quite small and the cysts themselves being uh, quite small within the kidneys, although there's obviously quite a lot of phenotypic variability associated with this particular uh, disease. If we look at histology from uh, end stage sections from uh, patients with uh, DNA JB11, we can see that fibrosis here with the uh, in blue, we can see is very prominent in, in these different sections. So we're getting a lot of fibrosis, at least in end state or date, late stages of, of this disease. We can see that the um, mutations are, are spread throughout the uh, gene and the, and the protein. Most of these are truncating uh, changes with only two uh, missense changes. One of these at this very highly uh, conserved uh, uh, HPD motif in the J uh, domain of the, uh, the protein. So now you can see that there's uh, 27 uh, different families being um, described with this disease. This is um, showing um, more work looking at uh, um, families that were identified in uh, the, the Genome England uh, project. So these were identified as cystic kidneys or uh, renal tract calcification. You can see these are all uh, truncating uh, patients. So out of 3,934 patients within this or families within this group, eight families, had uh, DNA JB11 uh, variants. And similarly, or uh, not so similar, but if we look at the NOMAD data, we can see that there's uh, 12 different uh, uh, lightly pathogenic uh, mutations within NOMAD. And so that uh, gives us a, a, um, uh, a prevalence there of uh, somewhere like uh, just under one in, in 10,000. So uh, this seems uh, pretty high. It may be that the, this disease is being underdiagnosed, but it also may, might mean in some cases that it's not fully penetrant. And certainly in younger disease in patients, this can be a fairly a benign looking disease. If we look at uh, the end stage renal disease or the uh, EGFR, uh, data in these patients, we can see that up until around 50 years of age or a little older, most have conserved renal function, but then there seems to be a fairly precipitous drop and so that uh, um, um, many land up in renal failure. And in, of the 77 patients that we studied, uh, 32 reached end stage renal disease with a median age of uh, 75. So this is a little older than in the uh, common forms of ADTKD and, and a little older than PKD1 truncating mutations for ADPKD, but quite similar to what we see in uh, PKD2, uh, for instance, cause of ADPKD. And from this analysis, there was no clear sex difference in terms of uh, the severity of the disease. Recently, there was a, a case report uh, published uh, from Australia, which showed the, the donor here where the kidneys seemed to be pretty much normal, or they think one cyst was identified. We can see the recipient here has multiple uh, cysts in the kidney, but when they took the donor kidney out, you can see that there's some cysts here. I think they went ahead with the donation, but follow, uh, subsequently there was a genetic analysis that showed both the donor and the, um, and the um, recipient had a, a DNA JB11, a truncating mutation. Uh, so I think this illustrates that this disease is pretty uh, benign at earlier stages, but then can be more uh, severe in, um, at a later stage and obviously associated with end stage renal disease. So um, here we can see this uh, ER 
DGA3, I hope you can see this. This is the DNA JB11 uh, uh, protein here. And this is a cofactor with BIP and has a chaperone pro uh, um, function within the, within the ER. And also play, so plays a role here in the, the proper folding of proteins, but also the ex, uh, um, export of proteins that are not uh, properly folded. So we can see in, in red here, I've indicated all the proteins that are now being associated with some form of polycystic kidney or polycystic liver disease. <clears throat> so you can see that this pathway is very important in uh, preventing these disorders. Um, this is a, a more recent study looking at the fu function of this protein and uh, it highlighted that as well as a function within the, within the ER, this protein seems to also get secreted and may play a role uh, elsewhere within the, within the pathway here um, in, uh, um, as a chaperone for uh, misfolded uh, proteins. We did analysis of uh, polysystem one, the product of, of PKD1 in DNA JB11 uh, null cells. And this is the mature form of polysystem one. And this is the immature glycoform of the protein. And this is uh, NOH and PNAG, PNA, PNA, PNGA's uh, digestion. So taking off all the glycoform forms or just the mature of the, the uh, immature form of the protein. And we can see that this mature form of the protein is greatly reduced in DNA JB11. The protein is also probably not cleaved as efficiently as it is uh, normally. And we can see that this seemed to be somewhat unique for polysystem one and not um, um, seeing the same effect <clears throat> in other uh, membrane proteins. So we think that part of the mechanism of how this causes cysts is by um, less a mature form of uh, polysystem one, probably getting to the cilium. Uh, we also looked at the surface localization of the, the protein here also in DNA JB11 cells of, of polysystem one and found that the level on the surface was reduced if uh, DNA JB11 was not present. We also, because of the phenotype somewhat similar to uh, ADTKD, also looked at the localization of uh, UMOD uh, and MUC1, and uh, you'll be able to tell me how convincing this data is, but from the wild, normal wild type protein, in the, the two, patient, um, two patients here, we saw more intracellular uh, um, UMOD protein. And then in terms of uh, Mach 1, uh, it was uh, um, an, it, difficult to tell whether <clears throat> there was uh, differences, but we did seem to see more of these aggregates of, uh, of uh, Mach 1 in, in cells in, in DNA JB11. And these were co uh, localizing here with the uh, BIP protein. Um, we also looked at the <coughs> unfolded, unfolded protein um, response to see if that was triggered in uh, DNA JB11 cells. But as far as we could see from, uh, from the uh, analysis we did, we didn't see very clear um, evidence here, either in, uh, in constitutive or uh, when um, uh, UPR was uh, induced here. So it wasn't that clear that this was being uh, in, induced in these cells. So just to uh, summarize, uh, DNA JB11 um, mutations or, or monolithic <coughs> mutations are associated with a distinctive phenotype, maybe somewhere between ADPKD and ADTKD. Often we see small cysts, uh, but the kidneys are not usually enlarged, although some kinds can be. We can see that it's associated with uh, later end-stage renal disease. Occasionally, we see significant PLD, and there's been uh, uh, intracranial aneurysms or other vascular events uh, described in four pedigrees, and 
as you know, these are elevated in ADP, ADPKD. It's difficult to know really whether this is significant here yet. So this protein has a chaperone role in the ER and maybe beyond there. Polycystin 1 is inefficiently folded and possibly UMOD and MUC1 are also inefficiently folded in DNA JB11 null cells. So I just wanna thank the, the people that did this work, uh, especially Emily uh, uh, spearheaded the, the initial study and then followed up with the uh, most recent study and Rory, postdoc in the, in the lab, also did a lot of the cellular studies associated with the work. And uh, um, Sarah here did a lot of the, the, the screening studies. So uh, that's, uh, thank you. Peter, thank you so much. This was fantastic. And um, exactly what I was hoping, you know, this, this uh, um, disease and this mutation that's kind of on a spectrum as we begin to try to understand the you know, differences and similarities between the different autosomal dominant diseases in the kidney. So this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, in keeping with our plan, um, I will ask people to put their questions in the Q&A. And uh, certainly we will have probably time uh, later today as well as tomorrow to have more discussions uh, potentially. Uh, but just to keep everyone on schedule because uh, I know that people have other things going on. Um, I wanted without further ado to introduce the next speaker. Uh, who is Marie Hogan, um, a professor of medicine hailing from the same institution as, um, as Peter. Um, Marie has actually uh, been uh, kind of a tremendous advocate for um, biomarker work in the kidney space, which is uh, extremely uh, needed uh, for these chronic diseases that uh, progress over a long period of time and uh, has really, I believe, has shown the field a way forward uh, for the development of biomarkers uh, for uh, PKD, but um, also for um, other kidney diseases uh, in a way that's really pioneering. And um, I'm so um, thankful, Marie, that you have uh, agreed to speak uh, with us today. So welcome and uh, looking forward to your talk. I think you might be muted. Thank you, Anna and Dr. Blair, for uh, this wonderful conference this morning and the offer of uh, asking me to, to speak today. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, are, they, are they visible? Thank you. Yes. Um, so the title of this talk I was asked to give was Learning from Our Experience with Polycystic Kidney Disease. Um, May I briefly suggest that you put it in presentation mode, Marie, if you could? So slideshow? Yes, if that's possible. Does that work? Perfect, that's actually perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I want to um, kind of go and synthesize where we stand. Since I'm a clinician and a nephrologist, I see patients with hereditary diseases and we as a center see in our, in our PKD clinic, see many different kidney cystic phenotypes coming in, patients coming national, international, local patients uh, for evaluation. And the large majority of uh, diseases are, are ADPKD, but we also see a, a mix of uh, patients with ARPKD and other uh, ciliopathies. And as you know, there are many different genetic forms of uh, ciliopathies identified and molecular testing is available. Um, overlapping with kidney cystic diseases, we see patients with autosomal dominant polycystic liver disease who also may have a burden of cystic disease of the kidney. Uh, and then we see an admixture uh, uh, of ADTKD patients in our clinic. And uh, we see undifferentiated patients coming in with a kidney biopsy showing chronic interstitial nephritis. And this group is an important entity since a subset of this uh, group uh, are, are, are actually ADTKD. Now, as we have matured in our process, our process for um, diagnostic testing with the rapid advances in renal disease in precision medicine and diagnostic testing, we've also been able to identify patients with unclassified chronic kidney disease with all ports or all ports that in fact turn out that suspect autosomal dominant suspect kidney disease suspects that in fact have ADTKD and of course all ports can also have a small burden of cystic disease and again we're seeing patients with uh, FSGS either primary or secondary presenting with chronic kidney disease 
who also can have cystic disease are just have an undifferentiated chronic interstitial nephritis and we're trying to understand uh, what disease they have and again rapid advances in molecular genetic testing have allowed us to um, to, to reclassify these patients. And then there's this big black hole in nephrology of patients who present with chronic kidney disease and depending on what country you live and what region you live and, and uh, accessibility to uh, advanced imaging and kidney biopsy, these patients may also have ADTKD or uh, milder forms of uh, inherited cystic disease or ciliopathies. Now in ADPKD, which is the commonest adult hereditary nephropathy, there are often systemic manifestations which we have to look at investigate and our clues to uh, whether this um, is a, a truly an ADPKD phenotype or a ciliopathy as opposed to other phenotypes. Um, so we have to manage those conditions as nephrologists also and make the appropriate referrals to subspecialists. So uh, the advances in, in the main biomarker being molecular genetics diagnostics and make, has really helped advance the correct, getting the correct diagnosis in these individuals that come to the nephrology clinic mm -hmm. and to better deliver the more appropriate prognosis, counseling and treatment. And so in the last couple of years in collaboration with the Wake Forest group, uh, we have brought in uh, Mach 1 testing in addition to genetic panel testing and whole exome analysis in our clinic and we have it so now we have a clinomics program in our in our clinic and we're able to assess patients with uh, with typical ADPKD but then also milder or unusual forms of ADPKD and as, as I'm trying to say here there's a very wide clinical and uh, genetic uh, palette of uh, uh, patients uh, with, with these diseases coming to the clinic uh, undifferentiated and so we're applying advanced imaging of course family histories Essential, and you would be surprised at how uh, limited knowledge of, of general nephrologists are in obtaining a family history. Um, but exome sequencing is now in our clinical practice, and I want to talk about that since we can have testing back within a couple of weeks and how we're, how we're applying that in our clinic. And then we also, in the last couple of months, are now doing more routine targeted next generation disease gene panels. For example, a polycystic kidney and liver disease panel, which also encompasses Umod and other ADTKD genes. And there's a, a major difference here between what's happening here in the United States and what's happening across the world and other academic med medical centers where these kinds of uh, genetic diagnostics may be uh, routinely applied in academic centers and are uh, performed in-house. Whereas here in the US, what's happening is we have multiple different uh, commercial entities largely uh, that are providing these services as third parties. They have no access to clinical information, family his limited information, family history. And so, so somehow we feel that the um, outcome of many of these uh, commercial panels is somewhat damped in its uh, application since there's limited genetic um, and family history information at the time of the clinical geneticist assessment. So we have come up with a different model and we have a, a through our Center for Individualized Medicine Precision Medicine Program now got point of care genetic testing in the renal clinic uh, and moving forward. In addition, uh, for the ADTKD a subgroup uh, of patients coming to our clinic, kidney biopsy is relevant here and I'm going to show you some examples of that. Uh, and uh, we're sending, we're, we're, we have a pipeline with uh, Dr. Blyer, Dr. Greca's group, Kendra Kidd at Wake Forest University and any patient with undifferentiated disease, we often simultaneously will send the Mach 1 testing uh, so that within a few weeks we can have an answer back. This is rapidly changing our practice as of yesterday we're getting patients that want um, probands and then their uh, kidney donor and then their other family members, perhaps parents all tested for Mach 1 as the um, donor, as the recipient finds out that they have uh, been diagnosed with a, a Mach 1 mutation and ADTKD. Now there's rapid advancements in the field in this area. The major landmark paper was Groupman in the New England Journal paper uh, from Ali Garavi's group in uh, New York, Columbia. And he, uh, using next generation sequencing whole exome panels, uh, they're finding a diagnosis Diagnosis, uh, a positive diagnosis in patients with congenital or cystic disease in about 24%. So we hope to achieve that or, or uh, improve on that. 
And the way we're improving on that is we're combining the clinomics, the clinical testing covered by medical insurance or as clinical care uh, with research testing in the background. Um, now, other, there are multiple other groups, Rosa Taras, and there's a group from uh, the Retimer group in Australia, uh, uh, and they're finding up to 30% detection rate of mutations. And uh, as we have found in our clinic, th there's a, a very good chance in ADTKD with clinical testing that we're going to uh, find a positive result. It's, it's in fact higher than than, cystic, than polycystic kidney disease often. Uh, the clinomics and WES sequencing, as we've applied it to ADPKD, we're finding a lot of interesting things, uh, li likely due to uh, the methodologies of whole exome uh, bar coding uh, technologies. As the PKD1 gene is duplicated, uh, there leads to be some concerns about how WES technology is picking up the uh, PKD1 gene and the results from these clinical tests. So, so our practice is different, perhaps to what's happening in Europe. And I want to put this uh, warning uh, because uh, we are struggling uh, as we brought this program in uh, to our clinic that there has been a lack of perceived benefit of genetic testing, especially by uh, third party insurance providers. And I think we have to try to prove and demonstrate that there's a benefit to genetic testing. Uh, the challenge of identifying the appropriate test is beyond uh, the capability of most community nephrologists and many of our academic nephrologists and so we need a focus group in our clinic. Um, the burden of insurance pre-approval paperwork as re required in this country um, is delaying and uh, hampering uh, and a barrier to implementing genetic testing in as a diagnostic option. So what have we learned from PKD uh, over this time frame uh, uh, that we can apply to, to T ADTKD? Well, uh, the systemic complications are a great clue in, uh, in polycystic kidney disease and there's been a great advancement with the advent of advanced imaging such as MRI and now in our clinical practice we're able to uh, uh, incorporate total kidney volume uh, in our report same day uh, from MRI and soon from CT and it's incorporated and built uh, to insurance routinely. So that's very helpful as we can provide the patient their disease subclass. I've mentioned some of the clinical genetic testing that we're implementing. We have a 40 uh, or more just disease gene panel for ADPKD polycystic uh, phen uh, phenotypes and including uh, Umodule and REN and other ADTKD genes. Uh, we're able to provide this testing as point of care for PKD consults and we're able to get same day genetic counseling through this collaboration I'll discuss with our Center for Individualized Medicine. This is becoming increasingly important and we have several other projects going on in applying this type of uh, uh, diagnostic testing uh, in our donor population or transplant clinic. Increasingly, it's relevant in family planning uh, as we discuss this, as nephrologists discuss family planning with uh, our patients, and we have started a pre-implantation genetics program. Uh, the, the research has been greatly advanced in, in PKD by the development of the imaging subclasses, which I'm going to go into some more. Uh, and recently, we've been looking at kidney density through uh, possibly elastography as in liver disease, but uh, in P PLD and ARPKD. But now recently, using texture analysis, we're able to perhaps determine whether uh, uh, patients have denser kidneys. So as you know, there's progressive enlargement of the kidneys in ADPKD. However, in ADTKD, that's not the case. In fact, it might be that there's progressive contraction and atrophy of the kidney due to the fibrosic process, and this may be quantifiable over time. Um, we now have the imaging biomarkers, which are recognized by uh, the FDA, um, and this is prognostic, but we don't have any, uh, apart from molecular genetic testing, we have no other diagnostic biomarkers. Um, We've worked on tubular and exosome markers in these diseases and other diseases, and they're very promising, but they're not ready for a clinical application or clinical trial application. And then recently, I'll show you data from renal function modeling decline, uh, which uh, can help with prognostication, but hundreds and, 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 and perhaps in validation cohorts, thousands of patients are needed for this type of analysis. I'll discuss therapies with clinical trials uh, that we're doing and uh, our 
Baptin program and other therapies. All of this work has been pushed forward by the Patient Foundation, and uh, they've been uh, engaged in this for 20 years or more as these things have advanced, and there are many PKD centers of excellence across the US now. So biomarkers along the clinical continuum, we think are very important, and the NIH, this is the NIH kind of diagram uh, for, for these things. So pre-diagnosis, genetic testing, pre-implantation, I think diagnostic molecular genetic testing, treatment course, of course, renal function decline, rate of decline of GFR uh, is recognized by FDA, and uh, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, imaging in these diseases. And so the uh, uh, imaging uh, has, has changed the paradigm for drug development from uh, applying uh, therapies when it's too late uh, to uh, applying uh, uh, therapies to people that might be likely responders uh, earlier in the disease. And this is key to uh, enticing pharma to, uh, to spend millions of dollars in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, developing uh, clinical trial programs for these therapies. And so this is key. And th this work comes from uh, NIH studies, such as the CRISP study, Imaging Consortium, uh, across several US medical centers in PKD, which sh showed in this long-term study here over eight years, which continues now still, that there is a correlation between the rate of decline in GFR and the rate of increase in height-adjusted total kidney volume. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a very reliable and reproducible biomarker. Taking a kidney volume, the Mayo, the Mayo Clinic and uh, many other centers are now using uh, the uh, ADPKD, uh, uh, Mayo ADPKD scoring system, which identifies typical and atypical PKD by imaging, and the five subclasses, 1A being mild to 1E, based on uh, kidney growth rates, 1E being the more severe disease, and hence 1C, 1D, 1E are the, the subclasses that are, 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 are targeted for clinical trial interventions with more severe, fast, fast progressive disease. Now, the atypical ADPKD cases have to be confirmed really by genetic testing, ideally, as there may be uh, contamination by other diseases such as uh, FSGS, a a ADTKD, and others. And I want to highlight how the, bio the diagnostic imaging uh, uh, has been used in our center uh, and using Rochester Epidemiology uh, Project to, re to redefine the annual incidence and prevalence of ADPKD in the Olmsted County cohort, uh, where uh, uh, using diagnostic codes from charts only, uh, this, ch this uh, figure here shows the annual incidence has gone up over uh, these decades into the 2000s. However, if we use both the diagnostic codes and the radiology reports and manual review of these imaging in this cohort, we're able to define a uh, much higher incidence annually of ADPKD. And this is work of Tatsuya Suabi uh, uh, when he did his master's uh, at Mayo Clinic. And so estimation of TKV and, uh, from MRI and CT can now be done in any clinic across the world with access to uh, cross-sectional imaging as such as CT or MRI and can be done in your office uh, by a nephrologist. And you can use the web-based tool from Mayo Clinic, which takes only a few, few minutes. And I'm showing this because some people may not be familiar with it, although many of you are. Uh, but this, this classification permits you to discuss progression of the disease with the patient and rate of EGFR decline and future prognosis. And it's key for trials since we can subclassify the patients that are going to likely uh, uh, respond to clinical trial interventions. Um, and these are examples here of uh, the more severe disease 1E and then the milder disease 1A and intermediate uh, uh, 1C. And so again, uh, the disease is very variable. You could have um, mild disease with, due to PKD2 is shown here, and then mild uh, disease due to uh, class 1B, uh, 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 PKD1 here, and then more severe disease uh, in a, a similarly aged patient uh, with a PKD1 mutation. So this is highly uh, informative. And so it uses the ellipsoid equation. Um, and so moving on from where, where that started, we now are able to, in, in 2020, uh, uh, apply automa automated measurement of kidney and liver volumes from, from MRI and soon uh, in uh, CT to our ADPKD patients in the clinic. 
and uh, this automated segmentation is now uh, uh, done routinely and no longer requires manual uh, uh, stereology. And the, uh, the, this, this, these studies have, have validated this as shown down here. And uh, what we think is based on texture analysis that the cis number is potentially also useful in addition to kidney volume in ADPKD. And so there's a wealth of imaging data in MRI and this uh, is, the, is the latest and greatest looking at uh, texture analysis and adding things. Uh, this again was done from the CRISP study of 122 patients who had MRIs and uh, <clears throat> had preserved kidney function. Uh, additional information from MRI was obtained to get this texture analysis using entropy, correlation, and energy. And they looked across whether these features could predict subsequent progression of PKD uh, in this cohort and found that this uh, type of information obtainable from these MRIs uh, uh, improved the uh, predictions of uh, a CKD progression. Now, other groups have, are also doing this using standard MRI3 Tesla. They can uh, assess fibrosis in ADPKD. Uh, in a small, this is a pilot study of only 15 patients, but found that uh, MRI uh, could detect uh, fibrotic density in the tissue. And this correlated with uh, negatively with EGFR uh, decline and perfusion volume. And so uh, this is very promising, we think. And so again, the, the wealth of uh, molecular biology has identified targets uh, in this disease. So uh, these targets have uh, gone to clinical trials and you're, most of you are probably familiar with the, the targets shown on this diagram and the targeting of the proteins and the therapies. But what I want to show currently in our clinic is uh, what trials we're doing at the moment. Uh, with a bardoxolone, uh, a new vasopressin antagonist, lixavaptin, um, kinase inhibitors, and the glucose ceramide synthase inhibitor. And then we're doing uh, continue observational uh, studies with CRISP, and uh, we're doing an observational study of foam sclerotherapy, targeting large cysts that can be drained and sclerosed and glued down. And then uh, again, uh, genotype phenotype correlations are extremely important and informative. We biobank our fluid samples. Uh, uh, we are doing basic studies on the mitochondrial pathway, and there is further in vivo development going on with sodium MRI imaging. Uh, so uh, other factors that may be associated with more severe disease to mention are plasma copeptin, uh, proteinuria for sure, MCP1 pro in urine, which is a, a protein made in cysts, has been used. However, correlations are not very strong, and this has not been routinely used, and it's not ready for the clinic. Other uh, markers in urine have been used. Uh, of course, inability to concentrate the urine, and then uh, <clears throat> proteomics, uh, which I'll go into. Um, but to come back to the genetics and the nephrology clinic, the, the point of care testing that we're doing, we're trying to apply this to all uh, uh, hereditary forms of kidney disease, uh, patients coming and patients coming with undiagnosed chronic kidney disease. And at the moment, we're getting a, a, a positive hit rate of about 30%, but it's higher with ADTKD. And so uh, we're able to provide genetic counseling to those individuals. We've implemented a faster turnaround uh, slice for cystic diseases, and that comprises of 40 genes. And the quality and the read uh, depth is better on the, on the slices than on the 350 disease gene panel. So we're, we're applying that to uh, the cystic cohort. Um, and then initially, we, uh, if we have strong suspicion for uh, ADTKD, we're sending our samples at, uh, simultaneously for Mach 1 testing. Um, and then we have a separate, so we, we have a genome, a nephrology genome odyssey board. And so we review all genetic testing cases done each month as a group. A clinical geneticist uh, is with us and our, our research group is present for this meeting. Uh, and some of our own in-house molecular genetic lab uh, directors are with us, although we do not have in-house testing yet for PKD or for uh, renal disease gene panels. However, we plan to have that in the future. Uh, however, that has been difficult to implement. Furthermore, we have a, another group run by our hematologists for complement alternate pathway and thrombotic microangiopathy disease cases. So we keep those separate. 
here's our team, we, uh, counselors, uh, uh, our nurses, and uh, our medical geneticists, that, that, and Dr. Harris participates in this with us, and our stone group, uh, as well as our glomerular disease group. So again, when we compare these two diseases, there's both, in both diseases, a lot of genetic and allelic heterogeneity, uh, where in ADPKD, imaging certainly has done a lot for, for, for our, our disease and study of our disease. I think in ADTKD biopsies, our, our, our kidney biopsies are going to be key, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. Um, the automated segmentation is now online in our in our center in our clinical reporting, but again, that's only uh, applicable to our to our center and perhaps not many other centers. And then the genotype phenotype correlations, as been discussed by the other uh, speakers this morning, has uh, been very interesting as there's some correlations with mutation type, as there has been seen with ADPKD in, in particular. The wealth of information and research done by Dr. Harris with truncating mutations and uh, milder mutations and their impact on the disease. And Dr. Legal from France, who was at Mayo Clinic uh, and uh, before coming to Mayo Clinic had devised the pro-PKD score. This is a very helpful clinical score. However, one does need the genotype information but individuals less than 35 males, people with hypertension, people with uh, uh, urologic events, uh, these people uh, can be classed using these, these features can be classified to disease severity, and this is very helpful. However, at the moment, we don't really have a lot of information about the atypical cases of cystic disease, although people are working on that. And certainly, I, I want to make the case for the controversy about whether we should genotype all patients, but certainly genotyping is contributing to, to diagnos diagnosis and prognosis. However, it's, it's costly and, and may not be uh, readily available for everyone. And uh, in, our, in our center, we're still, le still learning how to uh, interpret a clin clinical genetic testing in PKD. Uh, and we have the, the benefit of backup of, of uh, research testing to confirm some of those findings when they're uncertain or equivocal. Now, here's an example provided by Dr. Cornell of, uh, from our Genome Odyssey Board, where we've had patients come in with undifferentiated chronic kidney disease or perhaps a few cysts, and they've been found by genetic testing to have a UMOD uh, uh, mutation. And then we ask our renal pathologist to go back and review the electromicroscopy and kidney blocks for our conference. And you can see these beautiful structures as described by the other speakers this morning, uh, where you have hyperplastic bundles of in the endoplasmic reticulum seen on the EM, but these were missed by the clinical uh, uh, pathologist uh, prior to the molecular genetic information being uh, obtained. Again, a high resolution structure. So again, uh, in, in many academic centers, electron microscopy is available and is going to be key uh, in char further characterizing these diseases uh, and perhaps interpreting uh, the imp imp impact of mutations in vivo. And you can see the storage material uh, uh, hung up in the tubular epithelium in this high resolution image. And so again, here's a second case of a patient with a Mach 1 mutation. And again, I'm highlighting this because in, in now, in 2020, we have digital pathology and uh, it may be quantifiable, the interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. Uh, however, the molecular genetic testing, again, was key uh, in uh, diagnosing this patient's condition, which was otherwise undifferentiated. And so I want to go back now to uh, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> the recent imaging data and, and uh, how it has been intermixed with the data from genotyping. And you can see that the genotyping from truncating to non-truncating to uh, milder PKD2 disease influences the onset of end-stage renal disease. And the Mayo imaging class can be also superimposed on that with severity uh, uh, correlating with subclass. And this is data from the Mayo population. And what I want to show here really is the number of people it took to do this type of study and it, hundreds to thousands to make these kind of Kaplan miles. So, so this may not be possible in ADTKD, uh, but it certainly has to be considered. And then from that, the Mayo Clinic uh, data uh, was merged and validated with the CRISP cohorts and HALT cohorts of uh, 240 patients and 500 patients in the HALT studies. And you can see here individual
individual curves for a rate of EGFR defi de defined by in patients with PKD1 truncating mutations, where you see it's faster than non-truncating, than uh, uh, milder non-truncating mutations and PKD2. And what you can see here is that there, is a there appears to be a linear uh, interaction between genotype, uh, subtypes, and uh, EGFR decline. And so you also see that <clears throat> And this is, uh, again, confirmed in the validation cohort, although with the higher numbers, you see it becomes somewhat more curvilinear in the milder forms of the disease. And so the, uh, the imaging analysis merged on top of that, again, confirms that with the milder disease, there is less of a progression, a less rapid progression over time as reflected in these curvilinear uh, uh, curves uh, in, in these subgroups. So this is very important because it gives more individual uh, um, uh, uh, information for these different uh, subtypes. So uh, bottom line is there's a, a relevance to uh, having both uh, genotype and uh, uh, imaging data on these patients. And so Dr. Blyer asked me to discuss what we know about ADPKD and uh, genetic factors influencing intrafamilial variability. And there's a 3,000 patient whole genome array has been completed with two and a half million SNPs imputed to 11 million SNPs in all ADPKD1 patients ex exclusively from several global cohorts. This analysis is still ongoing. Uh, and it appears, however, uh, uh, that there are uh, outside extraneous factors such as lifestyle, blood pressure control that may be influencing uh, the power uh, of uh, how to detect uh, uh, loci, genetic loci for modifier genes. And large populations are needed and in the future it may be that we'll uh, be applying whole genome or whole exome analysis to, to these populations in order to uh, enhance the, the findings. And so uh, after 30 years of study of the uh, and identification of the, the genetic uh, sequence of the PKD proteins, the exact role of the polycystin proteins remains unknown. Uh, however, in recent years, the crystal structure uh, has shown that the uh, PKD1 and P PKD polycystin 1 and 2 proteins interact in, this, in a ratiometric manner, and that these proteins are heavily glycosylated and influenced by uh, 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 glycosylation uh, heavily. And so uh, <clears throat> these proteins are also trafficked to the primary cilium and the mechanism of this and many other interacting proteins have been uh, defined. The trafficking is vesicular and uh, not shown on this, but the protein is secreted in urine. Uh, and uh, is detectable in urine. However, this is not prime time for urine diagnostic testing in the clinic, but it is amenable to mass spectrometry and is shown by Chris Ward in a paper uh, this, this year in Scientific Report. We can get a, a great deal of information uh, from mass spectrometry as to the structure function analysis by causation uh, patterns of the protein uh, 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 from, from uh, urine polycystins, polycystin one shown here. And so now I want to end up with clinical therapies. Uh, a, a cornerstone of, of, uh, of interacting with uh, polycystic kidney disease patients and manage, managing them, and most important to the patients is control of hypertension. But I want to talk also about sodium restriction and the role of vasopressin antagonists, uh, which are in the clinic now. And this, uh, uh, this mechanistic slide here shows how, because of high aldosterone secretion in, in cystic disease, there is sodium retention, and this has to be, uh, uh, it has to be uh, addressed. And the, 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 there's a recent study from the Australian group, uh, Dr. Sho, published in AG, ADKD, showing that the uh, most prioritized patient outcomes uh, is, relates to hypertension, in fact, but also kidney function, uh, end-stage kidney disease, and death. And so um, we hear a lot of complaints about blood pressure control. And the data from cystic disease is very clear from the HALT study that intensive blood pressure control had uh, showed a 14% lower uh, increase in TKV and also reduced urine albumin excretion. However, the Hall study could not define a difference in EGFR decline versus standard blood pressure control compared with intensive, but the post hoc analysis
analysis did confirm that in people with rapid CKD progression, tight blood pressure control was associated with slower annual TKV increase and GFR decline. And so we need to target this. We need uh, adequate blood pressure control with multiple meds, but we also need, want to recognize the importance of dietary salt restriction and patient education regarding this because of work from the CRISP study again, and also uh, urinary sodium excretions that were significantly associated with kidney growth uh, as shown in the HALT study and um, uh, increased chance of uh, uh, of a progression uh, associated with higher urinary uh, uh, so sodium excretion. And so uh, moving to vasopressin antagonists, this is the first, these are the first class of therapies approved by the FDA and ADPKD, and there are thousands of patients on these drugs. In our program in the clinic, uh, the uh, uh, patients are, are started on the drug by the, the nephrologist, but our nurses lead the monitoring, safety monitoring program, uh, uh, monitoring liver function, uh, renal function, and clinical status of the patients virtually with the patients. Um, we uh, don't see a lot of evidence yet outside of ADPKD for telvaptin therapies, but to this group, we would remind you that uh, telvaptin and vasopressin antagonists have been tested in ARPKD uh, in the PCK rat and PCC mice, nephronophthesis. And uh, at the moment, however, it's questionable if they're of any benefit in ADTKD, but this may be a discussion point. So in summary, in conclusions, I've shown you um, from our practice and others, uh, the rapidly changing landscape of molecular genetics, a primary disease biomarker uh, that can permit diagnosis of ADPKD and ADTKD now. Uh, we talked about prognostic enrichment that's needed for ADPKD trials. This will again be very important in ADTKD. Uh, biomarkers in urine and imaging, heavy, heavily reliance on imaging, uh, current clinical tr therapies and trials, and uh, we have, uh, uh, I think, learned a lot from imaging cohort studies in ADPKD, and I think this is going to be needed in ADTKD uh, to risk, uh, uh, risk stratify and individualize management from these patients. We're going to learn a lot from pediatric studies where there's going to be a lot more uh, genetic uh, uh, findings available. And again, the importance of registries. I'd like to thank the uh, group for speaking, allowing me to speak today, the collaboration with the Wake Forest group and Broad Institute and uh, all of you today for uh, listening to my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Marie. This was uh, fantastic and um, <clears throat> especially useful drawing the uh, connections and the comparisons between um, TKD and PKD um, in terms of uh, what we can learn from one to apply to the other. And I was actually particularly interested in your comments about imaging which is something I've wondered about for a long time, but also, of course, biomarker development and um, you know, really understanding the natural history of the disease, uh, all important points. Um, there is a question in the Q&A, which I invite you to address um, if you would like uh, during the break, but you know, again, to be sensitive to our time, um, I would like to move us into a five minute break, um, acknowledging that um, Dr. Amali uh, Mala Warachi has joined us from Australia and it's now midnight there um, and she's a panelist in the next segment. So Amali, thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, let's just take a five minute break for all of us to stretch and kind of recover from being on our screens for so long. And then we can come back for the panel, which will be spearheaded by Tony. Um, thank you all so much. See you in five minutes. It will be, um, I guess, um, 10.09 uh, based on my clock uh, in terms of uh, reconvening five minutes from now. Thank you.
Well, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Okay. It's great to be back with everybody. And um, it's been just amazing uh, session with everyone today. And um, so we're gonna have just some uh, brief overviews by a number of different people about um, how things are with ADTKD in their country. And so we're gonna start with John Sayer. John was on, but I, I don't see him on right now. I don't know if we lost him. Uh, out of the office, he will come back uh, in a minute. All right. Uh, do you want to start with Peter then? Peter, are you there? There we yeah. go. Okay, Tony. I'm. Uh, let me let me fire ahead. Let me see if I can share my slides with you. Uh, share screen, share screen. Okay, Ken, I hope you can hear me. So mm -hmm. my name is Peter and I'm a, a clinical nephrologist. I would describe myself in Dublin, Ireland. And uh, I've had an interest in inherited kidney disease since I was a neighbor of Tony Blair's uh, 23 years ago while I was at that other great university in North Carolina, uh, Duke University. So about uh, eight or 10 years ago, I was sitting in clinic and I came across this family here. Um, and this was a family from the northeastern part, northwestern part of Ireland, which this lady here came to see me and she told me that she had 16 siblings and that half of them had kidney disease and her um, her mother died of kidney failure and multiple members of the family uh, got kidney failure. So we did a renal biopsy on her and she had uh, tubular interstitial kidney disease. So we went about and collected five other families around the country and Peter Lavin, uh, a then research fellow of mine, brought these samples to Duke University and spent five years trying to sequence the gene, initially found linkage and tried hard to find uh, the uh, gene that was involved. And then one day he opened up uh, Nature Genetics and found this paper and uh, we tested our families against this and hey presto, our family had uh, Mach one so that year, uh, we went to the ASN and uh, drowned our sorrows and met Tony at the meeting. And since then, uh, we've had a great collaboration where Tony has helped us uh, solve our patients. So about six years ago, we established something called the Irish Kidney Gene Project, where we set out to formally try and attach a molecular diagnosis to as many patients attending the renal clinics as we could come across. And one of my colleagues, Dervila Connachton, uh, drew the pedigrees on more than 1,800 Irish families with kidney disease, uh, Irish patients attending our clinics with kidney disease, and showed that about 30% of them have a family history of kidney disease. But for the purposes of this analysis, and we set up a clinic where we do uh, access to whole exome sequencing, gene panel analysis, um, a collaboration with Peter Harris there in the Mayo Clinic looking at polycystic and uh, Tony Blair and Kendra Kidd and uh, uh, Martina Zivna and Dr. Komp from uh, uh, Prague. And this has been very useful, but particularly in an attempt to address the question of autosomal dominant uh, tubular interstitial kidney disease. So I'm not going to go into uh, the, the mechanism and the background, but to say it's a complex gene. So we sequenced, um, we've, we've now screened more than 500 families with autosomal, with, poly, with inherited kidney disease in Ireland using gene sequencing technologies and identified 16 families that fulfill the criteria of autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease. And this is what we found. Uh, we had more than 56 individuals, 42% of them have a Mach1 mutation 35% have a mu mod mut mutation. Some of them have a HNF1 beta mutation and about 9% we were unable to identify. 
However, with the help of uh, Martina Zivna and her colleagues, we were then went on to do um, urine testing on a number of these uh, families. And uh, through that, uh, we're able to demonstrate um, uh, the presence of abnormal uh, uh, Mach1 protein in the urine. Some of our families are very big. One of the observations that we've had is that um, a number of this family, I haven't put it in on this pedigree, also have subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, it's not entirely clear that, it's, that they run precisely that all the individuals that have, there are a couple of individuals that had subarachnoid hemorrhage that were, um, didn't carry the Mach1 mutation. So our current hypothesis is that there may be two adjacent independent uh, genes and uh, Martina and our colleagues have done some work on this, but to date we haven't been able to really track down the gene. And this is a large um, UMOD uh, pedigree. So as one of the previous um, uh, speakers alluded to, we've done more than five and a half thousand kidney transplants in, in Dublin. And we wanted to compare the survival of, of, uh, PK, of uh, uh, ADTKD patients that are transplanted in comparison to the other five and a half thousand patients that we transplanted. And suffice it to say uh, that the ADTKD patients show no evidence of recurrence of disease and they do as well or better uh, than, uh, than the general population of, of kidney transplant patients uh, that we look after. Uh, this is alluding to the uh, urine staining and the biopsy staining that Martina helped us with that helped uh, identify our further four patients uh, that clearly have a mutant uh, Mach1 protein, even though we weren't able to identify the, uh, the gene mutation. So given that we have 64 patients with end-stage kidney failure with Mach1 uh, mutation, and we have a population of about five and a half thousand uh, end-stage kidney failure, we, we, we estimate that it accounts for about 0.5% of our ESRD population. And you know, many of these large families that we have are coming back to us with the next, second and third generations affected. Um, so we certainly uh, look forward to working with Anna and our colleagues. If you can come up, come up with a compound that might um, retard the progression of this disease. So this work was carried out with the collaboration of many of my Irish colleagues and, and many of my colleagues, Tony Blair, Kendra Kidd, Martina Zivna and others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, it was excellent. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to have Amali present next. So I was on a call with Amali last night. She's, she's been up all day. I went to bed, slept all night, and now here we are. She's presenting again. <laughs> so we're very happy to have our Australian <laughs> colleague. Thanks very much for having me. I'll just bring my um, slides up. Uh, it um, has been a long day between time zones. Um, so um, I'm a clinical geneticist and a nephrologist um, and also a clinician scientist based in Sydney in Australia. Um, and um, I'm part of a network um, called the KidGen Network and we're um, a network, a national network of multidisciplinary kidney genetics clinics across Australia um, with clinics located in all of the capital cities in Australia. Australia is relatively small by population, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So um, we have tried to establish um, clinics across the country in um, an effort to do that. Uh, our MDT clinics are run um, with nephrologists who have an interest in kidney genetic conditions and clinical geneticists who have an interest in kidney disease and genetic counsellors. And we see families um, with uh, either suspected or um, confirmed uh, genetic kidney diseases. And we work very closely with our colleagues in the diagnostic and research laboratories to try and provide these families with a genetic diagnosis. Um, uh, we provide through the clinic phenotype driven genetic testing. Um, so using uh, gene panels that are tailored to the, um, the patient's clinical features, um, using either exome um, or whole genome sequencing um, as the backbone for that testing, depending on what um, the specific genes it is that we're interested in looking at. Um, Australia runs on a universal healthcare model. So this is a state funded service and um, uh, 
pretty much all of the genetic testing is also funded through the state. Um, and over the last three years, as part of the KidGen network, we've been collecting data to look at um, demonstrating what the utility is of providing such a um, kidney genetic service across the country. And through that, um, we've uh, collected data on about 800 or um, more close to 1,000, I think, now families that have undergone um, genetic diagnostics through this network. Um, and so... With ADTKD particularly in mind, um, in that cohort of about um, 800 patients, about 50% of them had a genetic diagnosis made after genetic testing. And of those patients, 43 families um, had a, a diagnosis of ADTKD made. Um, keeping in mind that the overall cohort is quite a relatively a younger cohort, um, the median age is 26. Um, and I guess, like we know about ADTKD, within our own cohort, cohort we saw that there was was uh, some phenotypic overlap. Most of the patients that had a genetic diagnosis of ADTKD made had a clinical suspicion of ADTKD, but there were some families who um, had a, an atypical polycystic kidney disease phenotype and um, also some families that were suspected to have an amyciliopathy um, or a nephronopthesis diagnosis but actually had ADTKD. Um, and I thought I'd just finish off with one slide um, about the clinical implications of, um, of a genetic diagnosis. And so I spend a lot of time in the clinic as a clinical geneticist. And so I have the privilege of seeing what the value is of a, a genetic diagnosis for the families that we see. Um, and I really don't think that we can undervalue how um, important it is for families to have an answer, a reason for, um, for the disease that they have and for the, the reasons that they experience their kidney disease. Um, I often get a lot of people asking me, you know, why do we um, do all this genetic testing if we you know there's nothing we can currently do? But I think um, there are plenty of things we can currently do. And also that the power of understanding the cause of disease for a family is um, something that we as clinicians perhaps underestimate. Um, and it, of course, allows us to screen um, the wider family, um, as you can see from the very large pedigrees um, that you've seen through the presentations. Um, and it gives families options in terms of um, considering reproduction and having their own families and understanding what the risk is to future generations. And I certainly have a number of patients in my clinic who um, pursue things like IVF to um, try and reduce the risk of their children developing um, chronic kidney disease. Um, and of course, a diagnosis allows families to link in with other families that um, have the same condition so that they can um, uh, uh, meet up with people that have similar experiences to them. And of course, um, we're all here with the ultimate goal of treatments and um, a diagnosis is really important step in that. Um, and so that's kind of what we're about in the KidGen network um, in Australia. Well, thank, thank you very much. That was really nice. Uh, really appreciate uh, uh, what you had to say. And I, I know it's a very, very large country, as you're saying. And so there, there are a lot of issues um, to get samples and everything, I'm sure, and get patients in there. But I, I really agree with what you're saying about families really want a diagnosis. And yeah, uh, the doctors may not want, you may, may not be so red hot in making a diagnosis a lot of the time or taking a family history. And those are really two of our, our biggest issues. Um, so uh, thank you very much. That was really, really nice. Um, our next speaker will be Michael Wiesener. Um, Michael, it's great to have you. Yes, thank you. Um, my apologies. Uh, I didn't prepare any slides. I thought it was a more open discussing. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah but I, I can give a brief overview of the situation. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it's, it's still a fairly um, clinically and academic a niche in Germany. I think it's the same in many countries. Interest and awareness in ADTKD is, is I think, slowly increasing, but um, still my feeling is um, probably more than 90% of patients and families are still missed in diagnosis. Uh, I think that would be the, the situation still in Germany, which was quite sad, and I think which we which we all want to improve in the future. Yeah, and there are there are two laboratories in Germany that provide genetic laboratories that provide full diagnostics, including the Mac1 frame shift mutation. One is commercial, one is academic here in Erlangen. Um, we here in Erlangen have more than 50 families registered now with a diagnosis. 
which is at least compatible to ADTKD, I must say, I think we have to be careful, especially there where we have not got a molecular diagnostic uh, finding. Uh, from what we know now is that this is a huge group um, and probably some of them do not, um, do not have ADTKD. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, the field is moving slow also in Germany. Um, and uh, I think we can, we should improve on, on to diagnose these patients, these families. Well, thank you. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's like a common thing. Do you ever have, a, I'd like to ask you, um, and Amali too, if we could put her back online, um, and Peter as well, do you ever have families that come directly to you, or are they always referred from doctors? Uh, sometimes we have found, I mean, we, um, through our system, we do require a referral um, from a doctor, but we have a number of families that um, have forced their doctor into a referral that are clearly the ones that are driving okay. um, right. the okay. care. So um, I think that ha certainly happens um, in ADTKD and lots of other genetic conditions as well, where um, with these rare conditions, uh, sometimes uh, a lot of the time families know much more about it than most clinicians do. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's we're seeing that a lot. Well, thank you. I mean, you. John is back with us too, just to let you know. Oh, all right. Okay, good. So, uh, well, why don't we go to John if you can give us an update uh, of how things are going with you guys? John, you're muted, I believe. I think so, yes. Now, perfect. Okay, I have a couple of slides. Um, do you have to press the share screen button or do I? You, you can go ahead and do it. Okay. I'm just struggling to see it. Um, Down at the bottom, you'll see a green um, share screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great. Okay. So, um, Hopefully that's sharing okay. Can you see that now? Yes, yeah, so just for those that don't know me, I'm uh, John Sayer from uh, Newcastle upon Tyne, as uh, Anna alluded to. Um, it's um, crag size just up the road from, from us, but um, we've been interested in um, various inherited kidney diseases, including ADTKD for a little while. Um, I realize I'm showing the wrong presentation there, excuse me. Um, Um, so, yeah, you caught me slightly on the hop with this uh, research update, but um, we're based in this beautiful, fairly modern building called the Centre for Life, actually, which is right on the, the River Tyne in Newcastle. So uh, once lockdown's over and um, we're getting back to the new normal, um, if anyone wants to visit us in Newcastle, you'd be, I'd be delighted to host you. Um, we have a couple of um, really... Uh, good resources in the UK, um, as the NHS allows us to be very joined up in our healthcare. Uh, we have a couple of things I'd like to highlight. One is this resource called Ra this resource called Radar, which stands for Rare Disease Registry for kidney patients, and so it allows us to provide a national uh, map of patients with a whole list of rare diseases. And um, ADTKD is one of these uh, disorders on this list, and I kind of co-lead the ADTKD radar group. And um, as part of um, the remit for that group is um, hosting an, a patient sort of information day, which obviously we used to do in person, but now uh, we'll do virtually. And a bit like this international day that you're coordinating, it allows us to sort of allow patients to interact with each other. And actually a lot of research ideas and the research momentum comes from talking to patients at these days uh, and so uh, these are really, really, really valuable. Um, the other thing that um, the UK kind of has that's um, providing a, a, a sort of unique resource for us is the 100,000 Genomes Project. So this was a project um, actually conceived by politicians, but actually it turned out to be very useful scientifically. Uh, and so the 100,000 Genomes, initially the idea was to have 30,000 uh, rare diseases, 30,000 cancers, and 30,000 
infectious diseases but actually the recruitment to the rare disease was was so good that, that there's you know the there's bias towards rare disease. And so within this, this cohort of rare diseases, we can look for um, UMOD and various other novel causes of ADTKD. And so uh, as, as Peter Harris shared, we, we can use this database to, to find families with DNA JB11 and other potentially novel causes of ADTKD. We've also found um, that there's indels hidden away that, that were either miscalled or not called at all. And so for careful sort of analysis of the raw data, we can actually find new families with, with UMOD mutations with various indels that um, the initial um, analysis missed. And so with this in mind, um, work done by Eric actually, who, who you heard speak at the start of this morning, um, we found that um, UMOD mutations account for um, a large proportion of patients with ADTKD. So within RADAR, we've, we've got 217 patients recruited, and you can see Newcastle recruited 44 of these cases. Uh, but the fascinating thing is there seems to be this, this very common indel that's exclusive to the UK. I don't think it's seen in, in the States. Perhaps it's seen in, in Ireland, uh, but certainly it's not a common mutation uh, in Europe either. And so we think this um, common mutation, this, this indel of uh, several amino acids, provides us a chance to sort of explore uh, genetic modifiers because we've got a big group of patients all having the same mutation, but their outcomes are completely different. And so we, we've done very preliminary studies looking at um, kidney survival and, um, and, and different measures. And you can see that if you take this cohort with the indel alone, they're behaving slightly differently uh, and slightly less severe in terms of uh, kidney phenotype to, to other UMOD mutations. So I think, we think this is um, an opportunity. But if you take the group of indels alone, there, there are within those that group, there are fast and slow progressors. So again, this allows us, I think, to dip back into those patients that have had whole genome sequencing to look for additional modifiers of the disease. And this, in panel G, this is work that, um, again, Eric has done, we can measure urinary UMOD level, and it seems that these, these patients with the indel have preserved levels of urinary UMOD compared to other mutations. So, you know, this is allowing us to get some new insights uh, into this disease. So, um, that's all I wanted to say for you today, other than, you know, we're happy um, and very pleased to be part of this sort of international collaboration and certainly integrating some of this radar data with the red cap idea that um, Tony has um, will be very powerful going forward. Thank you very much. So that indel, I, actually, we have uh, quite a number of families with that indel that migrated, obviously, yeah. Um, did it start start in Ireland or England? Do you think? So, I don't know. I think it started. It may have started in Ireland. All right. Okay. It'd be nice to try and prove um, where the founder effect came from, but certainly it does seem to be. Yeah, this this sort of um, population in in some part of the UK and Ireland that then came to America. Yeah, but um, certainly it's very, it's rare in Europe, as far as I understand. Yes, yeah, so we'd be happy to collaborate with you on our share of patients with that as well. Um, so that was very nice, very nice. And now we will have uh, Greg talk from Cyprus. So it's just wonderful, I must say, having all collaborators from all over that we're all working together on a, a common uh, cause. And it's just really fantastic making new friendships as well. Uh, Greg. So hi, everyone. Uh, let me uh, share a few slides that I prepared for this. Okay, so my name is Greg and uh, I'm a molecular biologist and uh, I work at the University of Cyprus at uh, Kostandinos Delta's lab and uh, we're transforming into a biobank. So uh, we look at this project and from a biobank perspective. So in a nutshell, this is what we have, and this is how we've been working for the past 
few years uh, after um, Tony came into our lives and Anna. Uh, so uh, as far we have uh, 30, identified 30 families uh, with uh, ATDKD MAC1, 17 of which have, uh, excuse me, uh, 17 of which uh, have not yet, uh, we haven't yet found a mutation for. So for the rest is this insertion and we have 163 patients that uh, we know that they have this insertion. Um, also, we uh, have recently identified our first UMOD family and uh, a REN family that Martina previously talked about. Uh, it was one of those uh, mutations there in that paper. So uh, you can see, uh, I, I, I um, see some questions in the, in the um, question section about how, um, how this how a screen pipeline should be. This is what we've been using for the past few years and it seems to work. So we do genotype everyone for C and A insertions at the Broad Institute through uh, Kendra and Tony. And then if um, they're positive, then you have a, a, a diagnosis. But if they are negative, then we um, send uh, urinary smears to Martina uh, in Prague where they are stained. And if they're positive, then we move forward to discover the new mutation. Uh, but if they're negative, then, uh, well, anyway, we do all this stuff at the same time. I mean, if, if, uh, if a sample checks in, then we sequence, we do NGS for uh, five um, genes, that's UMOD, MAC1, excluding the BNTR, uh, REN, SEC61A, uh, and HNF1 beta. So I, um, also, uh, I need to uh, mention that we have 51 families that uh, came out negative in all of these pipelines. And we, uh, in, in, uh, after this pipeline was uh, done, and we will um, uh, proceed to uh, exomore genome sequencing. So Cyprus is a small island uh, in the Mediterranean. Our native language is uh, Greek. And uh, it's quite remarkable that um, a lot of these patients that have this mutation cluster in Paphos, uh, where um, uh, it's in the Western part of the island. Um, uh, there is where um, uh, Dr. Uh, Stavrou, Christopher Stavrou, um, uh, where, where he has his practice and uh, um, we do um, move, uh, we do uh, all these um, um, gatherings with patients and we keep everyone close uh, in order to um, keep the patients engaged and of course provide them with uh, a confident diagnosis. So uh, a lot of these families uh, 12 families, uh, most of them share a common haplotype, uh, which indicates a strong founder effect. And actually, um, Professor Dethler's group was uh, the first group to um, publish the MCKD1 region back in 1998. Uh, I have to say also that, well, we, all, we always thought that this uh, was more uh, frequent in Paphos, so one e in every 580. Uh, people has this C insertion, but now we do discover other families spread out uh, in the island. So, and these are our main activities. Um, we do uh, try to do deep phenotype by following up a group of patients for the past three years, and we biobank DNA, urine serum, and plasma. Um, uh, we do three to four um, uh, sample collections per year. And uh, now we're trying to analyze a um, series of data going back almost 30 years uh, uh, to uh, study this disease and try to predict uh, how it becomes more severe, how more, some patients are more severe than others. Um, we uh, actually completed the first uh, biomarker clinical trial using 46 patients uh, and cholecalciferol. Maybe Tony will talk about this tomorrow. And uh, we are starting a control trial this October uh, with 30 controls. Uh, we are also collaborating with the Broad, with, uh, the Broad Institute for, to discover biomarkers. And uh, the clinical trial endpoint is um, um, 
uh, Mach 1 FS. We're trying to measure Mach 1 FS in patients' urine and see how it fluctuates after uh, they are administered cholecalciferol. Uh, we're also working on uh, microRNAs isolated from urinary uh, extracellular vesicles. Um, so this is uh, all from me. Um, I'd like to thank, I mentioned uh, Dr. Stavru, who is also online and um, uh, attending this um, uh, summit. And, and um, just to say that, well, as a molecular biologist, how um, patients uh, can trust uh, their nephrologist and uh, this um, makes them more engaged and um, brings them forward towards helping us and they have been really helpful um, in order to um, treat and uh, cure uh, this disease and I'm talking about uh, MAC1. Well, so, thank so. you very much. That's great. Uh, just a shout out to Dr. Stavro, who's just a phenomenal clinician and, and really, I think, is a father of all, we should say, of all MKD. I think he found the, he really found like the, the, the family in Cyprus, am I right? And he really started everything. So, uh, and, and yes. I remember reading his, uh, his paper was like the, uh, was the MUC1 uh, MKD manual about all the different patients, a, a study in Kindy International. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, we're really happy to have him on board here today. It's really uh, an honor for us. So uh, Greg, we love working with you, uh, just fantastic. And yes, I will st I'll talk some, a little bit about the, the study tomorrow. And so uh, we're really, really happy that we had this and uh, thanks for coming and uh, joining us. And now I would like to turn it over to Anna to introduce our next speaker who we're really excited to hear from. Awesome. Um, I think this is great. I mean, one of the things that I put in the, in the chat um, is actually the concept of trying to compare notes on the prevalence of these diseases in each of our countries. I think that would be very useful um, so I did comment that the Garavi study suggests 0.3% of all uh, comers with CKD for ADTKD UMOD and um, Peter Conlon suggested in Ireland 0.5% of uh, the ESRD population. Um, Eric earlier mentioned perhaps 1% of CKD uh, and even up to 2% of um, ESRD in the Gastadol study. So just curious to sort of see what numbers are thrown out. What do we have in Australia potentially? Um, what others think? I know Cyprus is a particular case um, given the founder effect. I think we have a much higher prevalence there, but um, it's just gonna be interesting to compare notes and that will be important for, you know, thinking about deploying clinical trials down the road. Where, where are the most patients? How many patients are left um, undiagnosed? Um, uh, it'd be great to kind of begin to tally up what we know uh, as we continue our collaborations and make, um, you know, uh, make our registry more and more powerful so that it can, you know, power, power clinical trials. Also to um, Marie, Marie Hogan's point about that, that, that the registry is going to be critical, um, as has been true for PKD as well. So great discussions. I think we're going to have a lot more of that um, tomorrow. We have more scheduled time for free discussion tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that as well and uh, grateful to Tony for leading this. And now, without further ado, um, we're just running a little bit uh, behind, uh, but not by much. Um, I'm very grateful um, for um, being able to welcome Ben Deverman uh, to our uh, meeting uh, to give the second keynote address uh, for the day and to close out the day. Um, ben is uh, currently the Director of Vector Engineering, um, uh, the Research Group for ve Vector Engineering uh, in the Stanley Center at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Uh, he's a valued colleague. Um, prior to that, um, he was the Director of uh, uh, Clarity, Optogenetics and Vector Engineering Research called CLOVER um, at the Beckman Institute um, at, uh, um, at Caltech. And uh, he really is uh, very well known uh, for developing um, numerous AAV capsids, which are critical uh, for uh, uh, successful gene therapy programs. Uh, and he has specifically made seminal contributions to uh, developing um, AAV capsids that uh, specifically cross the blood-brain barrier uh, to deliver genes throughout the central nervous system. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, recruited him to the Broad, where he brings his tremendous expertise uh, honed at Caltech. Um, and prior to that, uh, for a PhD in molecular and cell biology at uh, WashU. 
So it is really a distinct honor and pleasure to have you, Ben, and thank you very much for being with us today. We are eager to learn uh, from you. Thank you, Rana, for that really kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Do you see? Do you see my screen with the slide? Yep. Okay. All right. So, yeah, it's really my pleasure to and honor to participate in the summit today. And so, I especially because I run a lab that does something so different. So, I I work on viral vectors, as Anna mentioned, and we're. Our primary focus has been on the central nervous system, but we're getting increasingly interested in the kidney and other, and other organs. So, um, so Anna and the organizers have invited me here to talk about our work for, on gene therapy and viral vectors for rare monogenic diseases. And um, it's really great to be able to interact with this community and hopefully stimulate a discussion about the prospects and challenges that are associated with trying to apply gene therapy to, to chronic kidney diseases. And, I think there's some commonality with the kidney and the brain in which I think they're both really complex organs with many different cell types. And so gene therapy is both um, really interesting and also very challenging because of that. So I think the unified, the unifying theme that I want to discuss today is why, why there's been so little progress so far in developing gene therapies for monogenetic kidney diseases and whether this is a solvable problem. And so I guess as a spoiler, I would say that I'm betting that it is, um, but we'll, we'll have to see. So I'm gonna to start today by giving a uh, overview of some of the recent progress that's been happening in, in other gene therapies, uh, and then discuss some of the challenges that I think are hindering the wider use of gene therapy, not just in the kidney, but in, in many organs and for many targets. And then discuss, you know, the particular challenges of trying to apply this to the kidney and how the types of approaches that my group and others, many other labs as well, are using to try to develop viruses that have new capabilities and how this might be applied to solve some problems in the kidney. And then finally, just wrap up by talking about a few things that I think will be required if gene therapy is ever going to be applied in the kidney, some of what the maybe unique and, and similar challenges are with other organs. Okay, so, so gene therapy, as I'm sure you're aware, is really attractive as a, as a therapeutic modality because it's, it's, in a way, it's so simple and it's, it's directed right at the cause of the disease. So either going in and trying to uh, replace a missing or on a lower, or unexpressed gene or going into something like a AD, uh, T, K, D and disease and actually trying to reduce the expression of one of these proteins that is, that is abnormal in these, that causes these diseases. So <clears throat> currently there are two FDA approved gene therapies. So the first is one called Luxterna developed by Spark uh, and now part of Pfizer. Uh, that is was based on a, a virus called an adeno-associated viral vector, which I'll talk a lot about today, and the particular type called AB2, which is probably the best studied one. And it's used to deliver the RPE65 gene to treat a, a type of blindness called Leber's congenital amaurosis. And this was the first gene therapy approved in the US just a few years ago, and is now being used to treat patients and, and stop or, or at least slow the progression of blindness in these patients. Another gene therapy that's been recently approved in the US and elsewhere is, is an AV9 based treatment for spinal muscular atrophy. And so this is unlike the, the, uh, the treatment for Leber's congenital amaurosis, which is injected directly in behind the retina in the eye. This is actually a systemic gene therapy where the virus is delivered throughout the entire uh, body of the, the infants who have this severe form of spinal muscular atrophy. And remarkably, this virus, this AV9 virus, had been shown about 10 years ago to cross the blood-brain barrier in neonatal mice and some other species and quickly progressed in, in really like 10 years from that initial discovery to uh, approved gene therapy, which is quite remarkable. Um, and what's also remarkable is that this, this therapy is you know taking these patients who normally die by the time they're a year or two old and, and 
quickly lose all their muscle control. And some of these kids are walking and talking and, and, and reaching milestones that are just unheard of for uh, patients who don't have any therapy. And so this is, this has been really exciting for the field of gene therapy and has just stimulated a lot of interest in other diseases that might be uh, treatable by systemic gene therapy. And so this is just a complicated table that I don't want to go through all of it, but um, just to highlight a few things. These are some of the, the current promising clinical trials that are ongoing for, for uh, different diseases. And remarkably, all of these trials have, that have posted results have posted some promising data. So for instance, there's, in addition to treating spinal muscular atrophy, there are now a number of different trials for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy where they're using either AV9, the same virus, or other AAVs, like a version called RH74, uh, to try to target muscle and other, other cells to deliver smaller versions of the dystrophin gene to try to treat this disease. And th these, almost all of these trials have shown some efficacy. So you can go in and do a muscle biopsy and pull out cells and find that you do actually get expression and, it's, and that's encouraging. And some of them have shown functional improvements as well. Um, the challenge is that to get to this point, the doses of viruses that are being injected in these trials are incredibly high. We're talking about somewhere, I think maybe a hundred, a hundred, yeah, a hundred billion, basically, yeah, a hundred, no. What, let's just say one, one times 10 to the 14th or more viral particles per kilogram. So this is a, just a huge dose of a complicated biologic to make and deliver. And the, the challenge is that a lot of, now we're starting to see some, some, adverse effects of delivering such high doses of viruses. So AVs have generally over their, you know, several decade history of being tested in clinical trials have been shown to be really safe repeatedly, but lately there have been some adverse events because of the fact that we're using such high doses. And in fact, in a, a trial for another type of muscular dystrophy that a dentist is running, they've actually had three deaths in this trial, uh, two of which were associated with kids who had some uh, pre-existing liver uh, problems. And so these AVs tend to accumulate pre at pretty high levels in the liver. So the liver toxicity is something that's seen at a low level in many, many of these trials, but these kids actually had some pre-existing conditions that may have made them more susceptible. Um, but that being said, there's still a lot of promise for gene therapy. And there's, a, there's many trials ongoing for hemophilia, both type A and type B hemophilias that are going pretty well, although one that was about, that people I think thought was about to be approved by a biomarin just uh, got delayed because they wanted to see more uh, durability in the data. And so it's, it's, that was a little bit disappointing, but I'm sure that that will have a good outcome eventually. Um, so if, as this technology advances, I think it's going to be possible to treat more and more gene, uh, diseases with gene therapy. And so we can think about treating CNS diseases potentially or uh, lysosomal storage diseases and maybe at some point uh, diseases in the kidney. But a bunch of challenges need to be solved to really make gene therapy a more broadly applicable modality. And I think delivery remains one of the major challenges is that we need, we've, we've shown, or not we, I haven't been involved in these trials, but with the trials that are ongoing, it's, it's pretty obvious that the field has hit kind of the high level of dose that is safe in, in humans. And so if we're going to improve gene therapy for and make it possible to treat many other diseases, we're going to have to develop vectors that are more efficient and can be delivered at lower doses and for both safety and efficiency reasons. Another challenge for systemic AVs is that um, most of us have been exposed to these viruses in the past. So many of us have neutralizing antibodies that can block their function. So Another thing that vector engineering groups like my like mine are working on are trying to develop viruses that can evade these neutralizing antibodies. And finally, the manufacturing is a major issue for this field because when you think about treating a small, uh, fairly small population of patients with a rare disease, 
okay, it's it's possible to use systemic AAV as a treatment, but treating even treating all of the Duchenne's patients uh, would just would it's going to be very challenging to make that much fire. So this is a it's a huge problem. So in terms of doing gene therapy in the kidney, there's been quite a bit of work actually to try to to try to develop ways of delivering genes to the kidney. Um, and, but to my knowledge, there aren't any active clinical trials where gene therapy is being applied for the kidney. And so what's been done is to take viral vectors like adenoviruses, lentiviruses, or adeno-associated viruses like I've talked about, and try to deliver these to the kidney through different routes. And so a lot of the early work was done with adenoviruses and these, you know, back in the 90s or early 2000s. And these, these viruses have some advantages. They can hold a large cargo, um, but they, they're they quite immunogenic. And so most of the cells that are transduced by these viruses ended up, end up getting destroyed by the immune system. So they typically give you just a transient gene uh, expression. Lentiviruses suffer from some of the same, same problems and are generally not used that much anymore for systemic type gene delivery, but but could be a potential option because they're they're not as immunogenic in general as adenoviruses. Uh, but AAVs are really where the field has gone for the most part for for in vivo gene therapy, and this all of these have been applied uh, through multiple delivery routes to try to access the kidney. So um, I've talked a little bit about the intravenous route that people are using for Duchenne's or for, for SMA. Um, there have been studies where people have also tried to go directly into the kidney through the renal artery with even clamping off some of the other uh, some of the other vessels to try to restrict restrict flow um, and give viruses time to incubate in the kidney before they're they're actually released I, those are all potentially promising approaches but things like the AAVs a lot of them actually persist in the blood for quite some time after they're delivered so there's potential for multiple passes of the virus to actually have a chance to interact with the kidney. Um, and then there have been some other approaches where the viruses have been directly injected into the kidney itself, which gives expression in a variety of different cell types, but is quite limited in the spread of the virus away from the injection site. So it's a, not a practical approach for targeting the entire kidney. And finally, one approach that I think is quite uh, promising is to actually deliver uh, gene to deliver viruses through a retrograde route up through the ureter. And this gives access to some of the tubular cells that are hard to reach through a vascular route. And so just as an example, this, this slide, I'm not intending that you all, everyone reads everything on it. I'm just showing this to emphasize how many studies there have been. This is from a recent review um, last, that came out last year that talked about all of the viral vector approaches that have been tried to use in animal models for, for kidney disease. And this is just showing tri or studies with AEVs. Uh, there've been many through many different routes. And I think overall, the, ch the problem is, is that none of them have been that successful. Um, there, been, there has been expression and some promising results, uh, but it's been a challenge. And as an example, this, is, this was not a kidney focused study, but this just shows the challenge with systemic delivered AEVs. So what I'm showing here uh, are these graphs are giving a readout of the number of viral genomes that are detected by a qPCR assay in different organs. So this is just a biodistribution assay asking where do, where do different AAV serotypes go when you del deliver them in vivo into mice. And a lot of them go to the liver. The numbers here are quite high, but you can see we actually, we actually get pretty high numbers in the kidney as well. Uh, so the, most of these viruses do, some of the particles do collect in the kidney and the levels are actually pretty similar to a variety of other organs, including lung and, and muscle. But what's, what's interesting is that if you actually then look not just at where the particles go and where the genomes are, but where the expression of the virus is. So this is using a luciferase assay that measures light output from luciferase in extracts from different organs and there's no expression in the kidney at the, you know, in, in contrast to places like the lung or muscle where most of the vectors express something in the kidney, none of them worked at all. So there's something else going on than 
in addition to just their distribution that is important for, for solving this problem. Uh, and so some studies that have tried to take a different approach and actually go up through the, the ureter um, have shown some more promising results. So here, if you take the same virus, AV9, this is the same one that was used in the SMA uh, drug, Zolgensma, and deliver it intravenous into a mouse. This is this colored heat map is looking at luciferase expression in the mouse, and so red is very high and blue is lower. Uh, you see a lot of it actually commutes in the liver. Um, but if you do this, use this retrograde route and deliver it to one of the two kidneys, you can actually see luciferase expression in the kidney. So this is suggesting that this is actually working and they could use GFP to show where the expression actually was. And you can see quite a bit of expression in different segments of the uh, tubules. And more recently, there was a study that came out with a engineered AV called ANK80, which was developed by Luke Vandenberg's lab across the river at, um, at Mass Eye and Ear. And so they, they made a vector that they've, they didn't design this vector for kidney gene therapy. It was just something that came out of one of the libraries that they made and they've tested in a variety of applications. And interestingly, when injected into the kidney through an intraven or injected in intravenously in mice, there is expression in the kidney and it's quite unique compared to some of the other variants in that there's expression in the glomeruli uh, as well as in the interstitial tissue and a little bit of expression in a segment of the tubules that are right next to the, the glomeruli. So I don't know if this is the, the thick ascending loop or what, what this typically is, but there's, they often saw this, this bright GFP expression right by the glomeruli. Uh, and so this is encouraging, I think, to the extent that taking a new, making uh, engineered virus might have the potential to actually change the cell types that are being targeted when you deliver these viruses intravenously and showing that the viruses do gain access to these cells in the kidney. Um, and so the question is, is what, what potential is there if you actually try to engineer a virus specifically for targeting the uh, kidney cells of interest. And so, like I said, this virus, this ANK80 was not designed for this purpose or screened for this purpose. Uh, so what if you actually did screen for this purpose? And unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that question yet. Um, <laughs> we're working on it is all I can say, but we're in collaboration with Anna's group. Um, but what I can do is go through some of the work that my lab has done over the past few years to try to develop viruses that can cross the blood brain barrier and show how we can dramatically enhance that activity of these viruses. And, and hopefully that gives us some, well, it gives us hope that maybe we can solve these other challenges as well. And so what my lab typically does is we generate, we don't know how to solve some of these problems rationally. So what we try to do is use uh, an approach that's similar to directed evolution where we're, we're making large libraries of viruses and then putting them through screens to try to find or selection processes to try to find variants that work better than what the parental serotype, how, how well that worked. So what I'm showing here is a, just a structural model of the AV9 virus. And it's composed of 60 different subunits here colored in three different colors. And what we typically do is we will insert a random sequence within the structure of the capsid, uh, typically using just a primer to insert random uh, seven amino acid insert or something into the surface at a place where it might affect uh, tropism of the virus without disrupting the virus packaging too much. And so we, we've, we make these libraries and these typically can have tens of millions of different variants in the virus libraries. And then we put them through various selection schemes. And so the first one that we were really interested in trying to do was to solve this problem of how do we get viruses, how do we get viruses into the brain more efficiently and, and viruses that can actually transduce cells within the brain. So the challenge when we started this is we didn't want to just screen for viruses that accumulate in the brain. Because as I showed you before with the kidney, for instance, there are virus, there are AVs that accumulate into in the kidney, but they're not expressing. So we didn't want to just select for those types of viruses in the brain. We wanted to find things that would actually uh, transverse the blood brain barrier 
get across and then actually transduce cell types of interest within the brain. So we wanted to build a, a more sophisticated screening assay that could pick out these viruses, but not pick out the viruses that are stuck in the vasculature. So the approach that we took to solve this problem is we took advantage of the, all the library of Cree transgenic mice that are available for doing conditional knockouts. And so we thought that if we could take a Cree line that expressed Cree in a particular cell type in the brain, we could use this to tag the virus sequences that actually are getting into that cell type. So the way this works is, you know, just Cree can obviously mediate uh, deletion between two lock sites, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, with transgenic lines, um, and delete this out. But Cree can also mediate a different activity, which is, sorry, if, which is if you have the lock sites that are inverted relative to each other, um, then Cree doesn't delete what's in between them. It actually just inverts the sequence. So we designed a system where we put the capsid gene back into the AV genome and put it next to an element that could be inverted by Cree. So then what happens is if, if, this, if the virus gets into a cell type that expresses Cree, then we can actually use primers to amplify the sequences specifically from those sites. And we can do this without having to do any cell sorting or, or isolating single cell types. So we can pull out things from one cell type in, a, in an organ that has you know, many different cell types. And so using this, we, we evolved a virus that is the, the, the first one we evolved is a virus we called PHPP. Uh, it was pretty remarkable when this actually worked. <laughs> and we found something after two rounds of selection that was about 40 times better at crossing the blood brain barrier than AV9. And so AV9, you can't really see it here, but there is actually, these are just images of whole mouse brains expressing GFP delivered by these viruses. Um, this, this middle one actually is a tenfold lower dose than what we use here with AV9. So it's a, not a really high dose of this virus. But we weren't really satisfied and we wanted to see if we could improve this further. So we actually did additional rounds of selection and found another virus that was evolved from PHBB that is even more efficient at crossing the blood-brain barrier. And so this one's more than hundredfold more efficient than what we started with. And it can give results like this. So this is actually a sagittal section of a mouse brain, uh, an adult mouse brain after injection of one times 10 to the 11th vector genomes into an adult mouse. So this is not that high of a dose. This is similar to what's being used in a lot of the hemophilia trials to target the liver. It's tenfold or 20 fold less than what has been typically used in the DMD trials or SMA trial. Um, but yeah, even with that relatively low dose, we can target more than 50% of the neurons in and glia across the entire brain. And this enhancement in tropism towards the CNS is quite specific for the CNS. If we just look at the viral genomes and where they're going, we see more than a two log increase in, in delivery to the brain and no real increase in delivery to liver or kidney, for instance. So then this, this vi these viruses that we've developed are now being used by a lot of neuroscience labs around the world to do basic neuroscience studies and to do proof of concept gene therapy uh, studies. But what we and others were really interested in figuring out is would these actually work outside the mouse? Would these work in humans? Um, and so the first hints at this came from some studies from other groups actually who tested these in some non-human primates, both in marmosets and macaques, and unfortunately found that it didn't translate to marmosets and macaques. So these viruses seem to, the effects seem to be mouse specific. So that was pretty disappointing, um, but it's still, you know, these have still been really useful tools and good proof of concept uh, vectors just to show that this is actually possible, right? Um, but what happened a couple of years ago, uh, Jim Wilson's group at UPenn, who's, you know, well, very well known in the gene therapy field, his group was testing the PHBB virus and tried it on some other mouse strains and interestingly found that it would it had a very similar level of activity as the parental vector AV9 in valve C mice. So the the all the engineering we did didn't actually help the virus get into this other strain of mice, which was really interesting and surprising. And at about the same time, I heard from other collaborators that they were having trouble with our virus in, in another strain of mice. And so 
we knew we also knew that the Wilson lab was interested in trying to find the mechanism by which our virus is crossing the BBB by crossing valve C and C57 mice together and doing whole exome sequencing to try to find a gene variant that might that might show what the mechanism is. And so we were really interested in this as well. And so a uh, research scientist in my group, Helen Wong, uh, took all of the viruses that we had developed and published, which be went beyond just PHBB. We found several other viruses that also crossed BBB really well. So she took these and we took them all and tried them in C57 and Belb C mice. And we found all of the viruses that we had developed didn't work in Belb C mice. So again, this was really surprising, but it confirmed the results of the Wilson group. Um, and so knowing that they were working on this and we also really wanted to understand the mechanism, we decided to see if we could take a faster approach to try to use mouse genetics to figure out how our virus was entering the brain. And so we found that there was actually the Welcome Sanger Institute had put out whole genome sequencing data on 36 different inbred mouse strains. And this was all publicly available data. And so I talked to people in Ben Neal's team, the Hale group at, in the Stanley Center um, at the Broad, and proposed the question, if we have all this data from all these different mouse strains, could we do some type of like mini mouse GWAS where we test our virus across many different mouse strains and quickly try to associate uh, a gene variant with, with, the, with the characteristic of the virus of either being or the strain being permissive or, or, or non-permissive to our virus. And so they helped do some simulations of to try to figure out how many mouse strains we might need to answer this question. We found across all 36 mouse strains, there were well over 200,000 um, gene variants that would be predicted to have an impact on protein function. Since this was a really black and white effect, we didn't think this was some promoter change or something in an intron. We really thought this would be a, a something that should be read out in, the, in a change in the protein. And so we did some simulations and figured out that by if we tested 12 or 13 different strains and got a little bit lucky, we should be able to figure this out. So we decided to try this where we would do a study where we could test a bunch of different mouse strains and, and, and try to quickly get this answer. And so we bought um, a total of 13 different mouse strains from Jax Labs and tested our virus on this in just a few weeks and found that Really remarkably, we found seven strains where the the mice were uh, permissive to our virus, and six where they were not. And so this was just about perfect because we needed a pretty even distribution for this to really narrow the candidates quickly. And remarkably, it did. It narrowed it to, narrowed the candidates down to two uh, SNPs in two different genes. Uh, interestingly, both right next to each other on the same chromosome and within a similar family. So we found a SNP in Ly6A and Ly6C. Ly6A is also known as stem cell antigen 1. It's a marker on hematopoietic stem cells, but neither of these genes are very well studied in terms of their function and no one really knew what they did. But interestingly, uh, and quite remarkably, both of them are highly expressed on the vascular, the endothelial cells in the brain. So they're expressed right where we would expect them to be expressed if they were receptors for the PHPB family of viruses. And so we, we then followed up and uh, did studies in our lab to try to figure out which of these might have a role in, in PHPB entry into the brain and found that, so what we did is we took, we took cDNAs for both of these genes and expressed them on HEC293 cells. So these are human cells that don't express either of these genes and found that when we expressed Ly6A, we found almost a two log increase in binding of our virus to the cells uh, com compared to the parental, the cells without expression of the Ly6A and Ly6C had no effect. And none of, and neither of the genes had an effect on the parental serotype AB9, its ability to bind hex cells. And we also showed that, so we, we wanted to do the converse experiment. We also showed that we could block this the Ly6A dependent transduction of cells using an antibody. So we took, we took mouse and the primary endothelial cells which, which express both Ly6A and Ly6C. And we used antibodies to try to block the interaction of the virus with the receptor and found that two monoclonal Ly6A antibodies were able to, in a dose dependent way, block transduction while a Ly6C antibody had no effect. So we were pretty certain at that point that Ly6A would, was the 
receptor for the virus. And we did some other studies to show that it actually interacted directly with, with our virus and that I don't want to bore you with at this point. But um, so this was, this was really informative and gave us, you know, a much better understanding of the mechanism. And particularly it gave an explanation for why certain strains of mice were, were not susceptible to our virus and also explained why the virus was only works in mice because these, both of these genes actually are only present in mice. They're not actually, they're genes that arose through some duplication event or something that, so they're only in mice and a few other rodents, not in non-human primates or humans. And so from, from there, you know, now our group and others, now that we've shown that this is possible to engineer a virus that is this much better at getting into the brain, uh, there's now a lot of interest in trying to figure out how to do this in humans, obviously. And so many groups are working on this problem, including ours still. So one of the challenges we have now is that, you know, we, we've, we're pretty sure that mice are a terrible species for trying to find viruses that get into humans. So we need better model systems, right? So the, the approach that we use to find these viruses is this, this create a method where we use this Cree, Cree method to select for the viruses is really challenging to implement in other, uh, in other organisms or in human model systems. You can do it, but it takes a lot of extra effort. So as an alternative, we're now develop, we've developed some new screening methods. For instance, one of them is to take, instead of reading out DNA and detecting whether it gets into a cell type of interest using this create approach, we now just read out RNA. So we've built new viral vectors that express the capsid just like our previous one did. But in a, instead of just expressing it during virus production when we're making it in, in cells, we have also provided additional gene regulatory elements that allow us to express it in vivo or in cell types after the virus transduces cells. So now we basically have two promoters that control them in different ways and we can read out mRNA as a functional readout of the virus. So we're not just pulling out things that are stuck in the tissue or in the vasculature, we are actually can pull out um, capsids that are expressing their own gene in vivo. And so this is a much more uh, broadly applicable system to a variety of different models, either human cell models or, or other species or mice. And so using this and other uh, screening assays that we've developed, we've found some new viruses that now cross the BBB in multiple strains. So these, since they're also going into valve C mice and other strains we've tested, they're clearly working through a mechanism other than through binding Y6A. And we've, remarkably, we're finding that these aren't that rare. It's not that difficult to find these viruses that have the, these new capabilities. So we find tens or hundreds of these in our selections now that, that work. Uh, you know, the, these ones at the top, this is a heat map showing in our library system, we get an enrichment score that tells us how much this uh, particular sequence is enriched over the, how prevalent it was in the starting library. And we can see enrichment of many sequences across both strains of mice in the brain uh, in the, but the, and things that are not enriched in the heart or liver or other organs. And a bunch of lots of other ones that are specifically enriched in C57, which are probably more Y6A binding uh, capsids. And so now the question is, can we apply these same types of approaches to develop AVs that will get into the, the kidneys better? Uh, and so this is ongoing work that I maybe, if I'm invited back to the second annual uh, ADTKD summit, I, we can talk about some of our progress. But right now, it's just an ongoing project to try to see if we can uh, use some of these same methods we've developed for the CNS and apply them to the kidney. Um, if, we're, if we or other groups are successful in doing this, then I think there's some opportunities to try to shut down or prevent expression of of the genes we've been talking about today. So Mukwan and Umad and, and Renan and others. So one option is to use RNA and RNAi based approach. So this would be similar to using ASOs, except that it would be permanent and that you're, you're delivering it with a viral vector. So you can express inhibitory RNAs from AVs using SHRNAs or microRNAs. So these are just different formats that ultimately end up picking a inhibitory RNA that can cause the cleavage or uh, blockage of transcription or translation, excuse me, of a particular transcript. 
Another option would be gene editing. So you could go in and try to actually edit out the, the either the uh, diseased uh, uh, associated allele if there were SNPs that made that possible or knock out both alleles if that isn't a safety issue. <laughs> Uh, I think that's probably yet to be to determined for some of the, for some of these, um, and so that's another option. A third option is to try to actually repress these genes. So there's actually really pretty advanced technology now to do this through a couple approaches. One is to engineer zinc finger proteins. So these are basically making your own custom transcription factors that you can target to a specific sequence. So you can target this to a region close to the transcriptional start site of your gene of interest and attach it to a transcriptional, uh, human transcriptional repressor and really remarkably shut down uh, transcription. And this, this, the most advanced work in this that I'm aware of is being done by Sangamo Therapeutics. They have a lot of the, the IP associated with this and really incredible know-how to, they've done this with the, in the brain, for instance, using our PHP EB vector and knocked certain genes down to like 90% by 90% or more. So it's, it's really quite impressive. And another approach that I think is really powerful as well is to actually adapt CRISPR and use CRISPR-I to try to do the same thing and repress transcription. So you can make mutations that block CRISPR's ability to cut DNA and just have it bring in a repressor domain and shut off transcription. And so this has an advantage over the zinc fingers. The zinc fingers, you have to engineer through protein engineering and it actually takes a lot of expertise to do that. Uh, CRISPR can be done, you know, much more easily by labs who want to do at least proof of concept experiments to shut things down just by programming with guide RNAs. So um, I think all of these are potentially attractive approaches for considering both in mouse models and potentially for therapeutics. And so a few other additional uh, considerations I just wanted to end with. Um, so we've talked, I've talked quite a bit about delivery. I think a couple other things to think about are, are really you know, that we talk about a lot in the brain, but I, you know, I think is different than the way people would typically think about things in with small molecules in the kidney, for instance, is with gene therapy, you can't rely on targeting every cell. So if you have a, if a disease that's caused by a gain of function mutation like this, how, how effective will the gene therapy be if you're only targeting 50% of the cells? And so I think these are really important questions to think about when when trying to consider whether a gene therapy might be a good approach. Um, another, another thing to think about is whether there's benefits or risk to having expression or protein lowering effects in other organs. So do you wanna target only the kidney or is it okay if you, because the gene is primarily expressed in the kidney, is it okay if your targeting uh, method is going to shut down production of that protein in all organs? Um, I think these are really important questions. And this also is can be solved in some ways by gene regulation. So you could try to you know, control where the expression of your protein lowering system is also using gene regulatory elements. It doesn't all have to come from the capsid. I think another thing that really could have a big impact on delivery success is whether the, the state of the disease at the time of the treatment might also affect the affect delivery. And I think this is potentially a really, uh, it's, it's a serious concern that needs to be considered when developing these uh, gene therapy approaches. And whether, you know, just the, the state of the, the state of the, the kidney might also make it more prone to an immune response to the virus. If you have inflammation or you have other, other, uh, you know, disease state that might actually make injection of the virus more dangerous. Another thing that I think is important for all, all drug development, obviously, is the timing of, and, and whether things are actually reversible and at what point they're reversible. But this is, this is, you know, this is obviously quite important with gene therapy, even more so than drugs, because if you take a drug, it's not as risky in a way because you can stop taking the drug. You can't stop taking the gene therapies. So we're giving a very high dose of virus and that, the patient will have to live with that. So whatever dose is given has to be incredibly safe and has to be effective right? because there's no going back with another dose of virus, uh, at least currently. 
finally, I mean, I think we're all aware that it's having success in clinical trials is going to require biomarkers and other ways of, of reading out, quantitative ways of reading out disease progression. And I think, again, this is really important for gene therapy, especially with small patient populations that are typically run in these trials. And finally, I don't think this is that relevant to AD uh, TKD, but it's, it's potentially relevant to other kidney diseases where, especially things like lysosomal storage diseases that might affect the kidney, where maybe the goal doesn't need to actually need to be delivering genes to the kidney. Maybe you can treat kidney disease by delivering genes to other organs. Um, I mean, if you can get a lot of expression from the liver or other organs, that might actually have a therapeutic benefit in the kidney. So I think that's always also important to consider. And so with that, I just wanna end and, and thank the people again that were involved in the work. I tried to do that to some extent during my talk. Uh, a lot of it was done by Helen Huang and Ken Chan. Uh, and we were also really grateful to our collaborators in the, the Neo Lab and the Hale team who helped us with our Minnie Mouse GWAS uh, experiment. And so, and just really thank everyone in my lab for making a really uh, happy, productive environment during these really incredibly difficult times uh, of this terrible, terrible year of 2020. So <clears throat> with that, I'll stop. And I don't know if there's time for some questions, but if so, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you. This was a really terrific uh, overview of uh, gene therapy and AAVs and uh, Clearly there are challenges for the kidney, but um, I think that uh, we're well on our way to, to try to address some of those. So any burning questions from, I didn't see anything in the Q&A, anything from the panelists? It's been a long day, I acknowledge. Um, it's uh, obviously also possible to have more discussions tomorrow. Um, the day tomorrow will be focused more on patients and the path to the clinic. Uh, initially with a small molecule approach, as we discussed earlier this morning, and maybe down the road with everything we've learned, um, why not for a cure uh, using gene therapy for these diseases? I think uh, that's kind of the end goal for our patients. Um, I wanted to thank everyone, our keynote speakers, um, all of our speakers and participants um, today. Um, we've had up to 86 participants that I counted. Um, uh, at one point earlier today. And I think uh, that just speaks to the fact that we really are uh, getting there in terms of building this community. And hopefully tomorrow we'll have more of our patients participate and uh, we can address their questions and also hear from them and learn from them um, about what we need to be thinking about as we uh, try to move toward the clinic. Um, it's really been tremendous to have colleagues from all around the world um, today. And uh, I look forward to the day tomorrow so I wanted to thank you all and uh, wish you all a good rest of your days or a good rest for those who are coming to the end of their days and uh, see you all uh, again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.